Hello and welcome to the Pens and Pixels podcast. I'm your host, Cal G, and to my left is the coordinator extraordinator, Mike Kent. The podcast is a place you come to if you want to hear about the art and news of video games, comics, and movies that week. That's right, we're the PPP, the Triple P's, or... <laughs> <laughs> I like that, I like that. Um, okay, so uh, last week we had a filler cast, but we're back. We're back in action now. Uh, we're, we're, the, the terrible duo? Nope, that's, that's, that's not a That's not a <laughs> Did you mean to say that? The dastardly duo. <laughs> Not bad. The terrible two o. The terrible two o. We have returned, and we're here to give you all the news and news you need to know. And after the break, we're going to go into a normal after dark segment where we're going to discuss uh, the last two episodes of Rick and Morty mm-hmm. and a uh, small review of Wonder Woman. Yeah, and also what we've been currently playing. Uh, Cal's been playing Metroid. Metroid: Samus Returns. Yeah, uh, and I uh, immediately ran to my PlayStation the second Tokyo Game Show said Final Fantasy is out now. Yes, Final Fantasy Nine. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Sorry, nine. Final Fantasy Nine. Yeah. It has returned, everybody. I think I jogged. We can finally stop. <laughs> <laughs> we can finally stop saying it. You know, if we were to do Tokyo Game Show predictions, that yeah. would have been on there. Yeah. Well, but it's, it's just been. It's kind of been on our list every time we've every done predictions. Every time, yeah. Every single. And time. it always seems reasonable. It's like, oh yeah, that's a little thing. We're almost at two years. We've done two Tokyo Game Shows in every uh, conference. I guess you call them. Is that what they're called? Yeah, conference. They're conferences. Like E yeah. three is a conference. Press conference. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um. Every single year, and we're like, oh yeah, just give us fucking Final Fantasy IX. Not even an HD remaster, just literally take the game you've imported yep. onto five different consoles, Yep. and just put it on this one. And it'll be fine. You probably good. have it in a little package, and a button that says export the PS4. Yes! <laughs> it could have been that hard. Why did it take you so long? Yeah. But it's finally here, so you can go download it now. Uh, I very much appreciate that they did that. Oh, yeah. Uh, and for not a half bad price. I mean, I thought they were going to come back and give you, like, full game price because it's a full game. Instead, it was a little bit cheaper. What is it, 19? It was like 19 bucks. Yeah, I paid, yeah, I paid it. I didn't even care. It could have been like 100 and I'm like, <laughs> sold. I'll uh, buy it again, fifth time. Uh, so, is there any uh, housekeeping mic? <clears throat> uh, yeah, I mean, just to say, as usual, thank you so much, everyone who came out to the Drink and Draw uh, last Thursday. Please keep coming out to them. It's always fun to drink and to draw. Uh, and, uh, oh, we do have stuff coming, but I don't want to spoil it. <laughs> That's okay. We can do it closer to the, the dates yeah. of whatever's happening. Uh, but we actually, uh, I think by next week, I'm going to be starting to make some pretty epic announcements, uh, regarding, uh, Pens and Pixels itself and some events it's doing and also CGX. Mm. Yeah. Stay tuned, dear listeners. Mm-hmm. So that's it. It's time for the Newsy News. <laughs> Yeah, a little bit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> just a little. Just because it's very little. loud to start off, and then we yeah. trail it off, and it's like, all right. We gotta, get the, we gotta get the full effect. I do like the banter behind it the whole time. Yeah, it's almost like a news show when they're like starting up the morning show, and yeah. they're like, dun, dun, dun. Sorry, oh, Carol, you look good today. And she's like, that's sexual harassment. Yeah. <laughs> I want that to be the intro every single time where they're just like talking, but they're like talking about horrible things. It's like, I did all this coke last night. <laughs> it's hot mic, it's a hot mic. Don't let me. <laughs> and I've been bleeding like from my ears? Actually, for, for After Dark, what I've been watching this week has been a bunch of news bloopers, because I've had uh, both sets of parents in town, so it's yeah. just like, you know, they don't want to sit there and watch, like, a three-hour long movie, but they're like, let's watch an hour long of news bloopers, and I'm like, okay. <laughs> I'm like, that's well, fine, they're funny. Yeah, at the same time, at least you don't have to sit there and be like, fuck, okay, well, this show's only half an hour long, what show do I put on next? Yeah, like, that's what true. What do they even fucking want to watch? Uh, yeah, so I probably saw every news blooper from 2014 onwards. I'm very lucky with my parents in that context, though, is that they have to watch, like, every single HBO show. Like, they... they uh, oh, wow. Was it TiVo, was that it? When you record shit? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I fucking stream. Um, and, uh, DVR. DVR. Whatever DVR. Fuck, doesn't yeah, matter. Yeah. Uh, but they... The, everything. It's like Walking Dead, Game of Thrones, uh, you name it. They go down the list of all the major shows that are out right now. Every single time I come over, they're like, oh, have you watched the latest? I'm like, how are you watching more TV than I am? My parents are so the opposite. My parents, like, barely consume media at all. Like, the f- they went to... Okay. They went to the theater once in 1999. <laughs> they saw Pokemon <laughs> the first movie with me because I was too young to go by myself. Yeah. Then in, like, 2011, they went and saw the remake of True Grit with their with our neighbors. They've never been back since. <laughs> what, what are they watching on a weekly basis? Not much. Yeah. They put on CSI and fall asleep on the couch. Or I something like that. I don't even know where my parents find the time, though. Like, for like myself, I have TV time, you know, and it's usually like two hours or so in an evening. My parents are, like, way more busy. They, they always have something, and my mom does, like, two jobs. Uh, she doesn't even need to do two jobs. She just does two jobs. Did, uh, do they get up really early, and maybe instead of starting their day, they just watch The Walking Dead? No, they get up at, that's just the thing. They get up at reasonable, normal times. My mother doesn't really sleep, though. 
like that's the thing like i i love this every night sometimes i go over and i spend the like nights over at their place to hang out and my dad will be out probably by about one or two in the morning mm-hmm. um but my mother will go to work from nine till six right yep and she'll be home by six thirty ish cram dinner down her face uh split out the door go to the casino huh. uh she'll gamble and have fun which she loves doing because she's like this high roller room and she gets fancy meals and shit mm. um until like three in the morning and she'll roll in and i'm still awake because i'm the night owl person right and i'm like gaming or drawing or something and then i'll be like all right night mom and then she goes into a room and then she starts doing taxes huh. and i'm just like you know, when are you sleeping? You go to work tomorrow. It's you got to get up at six. It's like an hour of sleep, and she gets back up and does it again. I'm That's like, baller lifestyle. Yeah, I'm like, good god, mom, you're like in your sixties and you're kicking every <laughs> single child's ass. Like, way to go. Yeah, I have one thing to do in a week, and I'm like, I'm drained. Yeah. <laughs> You know, that one social event, and you're like, fucking Jesus. Uh, I'm like, wow, that took it out of me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's get into the actual losing news. Uh, let me bring you back to uh, about a year ago, in November of 2016. A story we reported on. A story we reported on about The Predator. And if you've been following us for this long, you know that we love Shane Black, <laughs> the director of the, the new Predator movie and uh, such things as Iron Man 3 and Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. Yeah. And this whole adventure has led us to believe that he's legitimately uh, broken inside. Yes, um, he would. There were, uh, around right around this time, there were a bunch of stories about how just a bunch of little predator tidbits, you know, yeah. a bunch of things about predator, and uh, and he kept talking about it. And he would say like, "No, that's not happening. Yeah. Mm-mm, we're not using CGI. No, 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 that's not happening." And there would always be like a report contrary. But the thing that really started it all was Shane Black's the predator won't venture into the suburbs after all. He was adamant about it. Slipped into last week's report about Olivia Munn joining Shane Black's The Predator was word that the film would be venturing into the wild world of suburbia. The news caught a lot of fans' attention, since that's not really where one would expect to find the franchise, and generated some excitement because if anyone can make that combination work, it's probably Shane Black. But it turns out he's not planning to go that route after all. The writer and director has since spoken up to clarify that his Predator movie will not take place in the suburbs, which means we're back to square one in terms of trying to figure out Predator plot details. Yes, he, he was really adamant about this. Like, some people came back in, and, like, there was a news report once, I think we reported on, where someone said it will be in there, and then Shane Black, like, spoke out and was, like, really, like, it's not happening there. Yep. Very, very adamant. And now, a year, almost a year later, <laughs> the Predator is officially heading to suburbia. <laughs> Plot details have been a little sketchy, but we'd heard previously the long-awaited new Predator movie is going to feature a suburban setting. <laughs> Had you now. <laughs> uh, we've got a Predator film coming out, and that is unexpected and utterly fresh. I just imagine what it would take 500 hours to read the script, and that it would be interior jungle, exterior more jungle, and then fighting happens. But Emma Watts went out and recruited Shane Black. From the first page, it didn't read like a Predator film. It's set in suburbia. There's a little boy and his dad at the center of the action. Yeah, that's uh, being confirmed from Fox CEO Stacey Snyder, so... Expect next week we'll have a report from Zack Snyder being angry that she said anything that's confirming anything. Shane Black, not Zack Snyder. Oh, shit, sorry. <laughs> Same person. Um, <laughs> uh, Shane Black is just going to, like, lean back. He's going to be wearing, like, kind of, like, dad shorts, like de- like jorts, right? He's going to yeah. be way too high for his age. Mm-hmm. He's going to lean back in a chair, and one ball's going to hang out. And it's very, like, you know, he's, he's premeditated this. And he's going to look a reporter directly in the eye and say, I never directed The Predator. <laughs> He's going to be on a press junket tour and just say, like, this isn't my movie. <laughs> I never created this. I never did anything. He's just going to he's gonna start just start lying wholesale now. Yeah, this is completely opposite. <laughs> a, this movie is called Predator, but it's actually about aliens. <laughs> like the aliens from, like, you know what I mean? Like, it's actually about child predators. Yeah. And I don't know where everyone's getting this dreadlocked extraterrestrial <laughs> nonsense from. There's a big, like, cut of behind him of a Predator. <laughs> Actually, I'm making the new Godzilla film. It's, I now call it The Predator. It's just going to be this giant uh, Godzilla. Is it in suburbia? No! They tried to give me some shit about licensing. Didn't happen. Didn't, Didn't listen. Didn't listen. Again, he's right behind a big poster that says The Predator. Yeah, it's got like, the Predator mask on it. There's even a guy in a costume behind him. I still believe, like, he's fully insane chasing seagulls across, like, the Warner Brothers lot. I hope so. I really, like, I just want, I just want new stories about Shane Black's movies for the rest of time. Yeah. I want to hear uh, what he says about them. Oh, God. I, I, I really do. Like, I, I want, like, a camcorder footage of just, like, someone standing up in a building in the, in the lot, right? And it's just them uh, taking rec- recordings of Shane Black every day just doing shit out in the yard. <laughs> you know, like, chasing a squirrel around a tree for, like, half an hour. And then, like, they, they come back two hours later, and he's still going. He's He has only, he has only one rake in the yard, but he pulls a side show bob where it hits him in the face, like, <laughs> once every half hour-ish. But he keeps placing it in front of himself to do it. 
<laughs> and keeps acting stunned when it happens. Yeah. Because there is no rake. I feel like when the Predator comes out, like, on Blu-ray, we should, like, give it another watch. Because this is going to be what we review day one. Yeah. And, uh, like, listen to his director's commentary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. He's like, I didn't do this. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, next up. Uh, you see this, this whole scene? I don't remember this. <laughs> this is all... Oh. Who's Olivia Munn? <laughs> yeah. My medication has kicked in, and I kind of forgot this whole part. Probably a good thing. Where's Arnold Schwarzenegger? I thought he was in these. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next up. If you don't know, uh, we do another side podcast for uh, a Japanese manga we really like, and anime, Hunter x Hunter. If you, if you like anime at all, I, I highly suggest watching it. Um, but the or artist... Uh, the art, Yeah, or reading it. Uh, the artist, uh, Yashihiro Tagashi... Um, uh, he was asked, uh, on, he's, he's very slow. If you don't know, he's, a uh, the manga is constantly going on hiatus mm -hmm. and everyone honestly just keeps asking, you know, why doesn't he just write the manga and get a bunch of assistants to draw and ink it and do all that stuff? So that's also part of it is as he's been working on it, he's had to stop due to either health problems and, or God knows. Um, and he's the guy who writes, draws, Inks. Inks, panels. Like, he does the whole thing himself from beginning to end, which is commendable to any artist. Totally. Period. He's a one-man show. Yeah. And it's one of the greatest pieces of art for manga I've ever read. So he commented on the uh, the thought of uh, leaving his inking to the assistants, and he said, If I did that, I think that would be the end of my life as a manga creator. <laughs> which is crazy. Yeah. Like, you know, that's, I, like, good on him. Like, I know he's being super slow, but it's nice to see that he still has... Like the passion and the drive to tell the story, even if it is coming out like you know one chapter a year. Yeah, but that's an interesting contrast too, right? Because he's married to the guy or guy married <laughs> to the girl. Uh, there could have been a guy uh, who created Sailor Moon. Yep. Um, which means, like, money wise, who the fuck cares? They're they're good for infinity, right? Uh, so everyone always said, oh, he's on hiatus all the time because he's married to her yeah. and he has no need for money, so he just does this as a passion passion project. But if that were the case. He wouldn't be like, I'm going to do it myself the whole time. Yeah. Like, it's a clear, honest statement right here. It's like, I have all the money. I have all the success. I have my own sh uh, manga and show, which is very popular. Not Sailor Moon popular, but very, very popular. Yep. Um, and nevertheless, I still one-man it. Like, it's it's an integrity thing. And, and he also has a, another anime behind him, Yu Yu Hakusho, and yeah. a manga that he wrote and, and drew the entire thing, too. So. And Yu Yu Hakusho had a really strong following. Plus, it was long... Was it long? It was long. Yeah. I never, I never actually read that one. I've always wanted to go back and do it. Uh, another comment here from this little interview uh, that also tickled me was um, uh, Tagashi said, listen to what the edit editorial department says at first, and then once you start to sell, do whatever the hell you want. And that kind of makes sense for how Hunter started out. It was a very, like, normal, shonen seeming like, you know, yeah. show. and Like, and until, and... The, like, some of the, uh, the, the details and eccentricities of Hunter and his writing. Like, even before Nen showed up, because Nen is definitely a huge component of that, but... Nen being the superpower they use in the show. Um, like, just the sheer thought process of it behind, like, gone tracking uh, Hisoka yeah. and stuff. Like, and, like, literally, like, if I call my breathing and fall like an animal. and Like, the little tiny details that he covers in a way that no one else does. Or even him being in the hunter exam and uh, getting his arm broken, you know? Yeah. It's just this, they, these things you're like, oh, fuck. Yeah. Like, like he right. won the fight just with sheer emotion, which is yeah. something that's done in Shonen and manga all the time, but he did this, like, literally as it would be in, like, a, a war setting. Yeah, know? it was, yeah, it was fantastic. Yeah. So anyways, if you don't, uh, you know, if you, if you like that kind of thing, go check out Hunter x Hunter. Uh, we obviously like it a lot because we mm -hmm. do a podcast dedicated to it. Yeah. Go check it out. Dan Harmon, creator of Rick and Morty, co-creator, mm -hmm. is pissed at Rick and Morty fans for harassing female writers. Cartoon Network's Adult Swim blog doesn't have a particularly good hi history of treating women fairly, so it seemed like a good sign when Rick and Morty, one of Adult Swim's most high-profile shows, made an effort to hire more female writers in the lead-up to its third season. Unfortunately, some of the show's fans didn't get the memo that they, like Adult Swim, should stop being such misogynistic assholes. Uh, Entertainment Weekly talked to Rick and Morty co-creator Dan Harmon about this, and it sounds like he's pretty pissed off. I was familiar going into the third season having talked to Felicia Day that any profile women get doxxed, they get harassed, they get threatened, they get slandered. And part of it is a testosterone-based subculture patting themselves on the back for trolling these women. Because it, to the extent that you can get a girl to shriek about a frog, you've proven girls are girly, and there's no crime in assaulting her with a frog because it's all in the name of proving something, I think it's all disgusting. He went on to discuss how much it frustrates him to know that people like this watch the show. Those knobs that want to protect the content they think they own, and somehow combine that with their need to be proud of something they have, which is often only their race or gender. It's offensive to me as someone who was born male and white and still works way harder than them, that there's some white male fan out there trying to further some creepy agenda by, quote, protecting my work. I've made no bones about the fact that I loathe these people. It fucking sucks. 
And the only thing I can say is if you're lucky enough to make a show that's really good that people like, that means some bad people are going to like it too. You can't just insist that everybody who watches your show get their head on straight. And I'm speaking for myself. I don't want the show to have a political stance. But at the same time, individually, these harassers aren't politicians and don't represent politics. They represent some shit that I probably believed when I was 15. Yeah. So Well said. Uh, well said. I don't know if anyone else has ever watched it, but right after the uh, Tiki Torch uh, protest there with the white supremacists, Dan Harmon made a video from his podcast uh, and live performance podcast that he does, um, screeching about, literally screeching, mm. about uh, white supremacists and Nazis and stuff and how Nazis are unacceptable, which, of course, we agree with. Um, he's a highly passionate man. He always yep. has been. Like, even during his work with Community, when like Community was getting popular and he was getting kind of pissy with it, um, he's always been very highly passionate. But the thing is, is that his messages aren't incorrect. And I think, you know, while he's like kind of abrasive with the way he does this kind of stuff. Yep. I think it's kind of necessary in these days. Yeah. So I really appreciate it. And he's well, like, there's nothing incorrect about what he said. Alex, I like when people speak their mind, even if I don't agree with their opinion. I hate, I always hate the buttoned up, collared down, like, well, not all fans represent the stance of the show. Yeah. Blah, blah. You and know, we like, support like, women very nicely and women are nice. And yeah. we are very happy to make sure that happens. Yeah. It's like, he struck back a little here and that's nice to see. Um, it, it, and I, I've, I've seen a bunch of this hate online. Like I would love to, have none of this news have come out and just to see what these people thought, you know? They were like, like, you know, are you, are you all, they all of a sudden guessing? There are women writers now, you know, and getting mad or like, you know. All I have is in my head is this image of my head is like, so you know the uh, uh, Family Guy episode where uh, they all pretend to do jackass stunts? Yeah. Um, and then uh, Quagmire puts bees on his crotch. Yes. Yes. Uh, and then uh, Peter is like screaming at them going, I hate you bees. I hate you bees. Right? <laughs> yeah. I just picture like all these guys getting down to like women's crotches and going like, I hate you vagina. I hate you vagina. I hate you vagina. <laughs> like the, that's like all you can do. Like, it's just like you hate this thing so much. It's so, it, it's so, just, I know we've discussed this on the show many times. I, I just, will continue until something changes. Yeah. Cause I've just, it's constantly just such a, a mystery to me why these people mm. do this, you know? like yeah we, they, women can do the things that men do shocker <laughs> and they continue to have jobs like and they're just angry that they have jobs like i don't and, and plus even right now as uh there's a slow but still shift in comedy i find women right now are actually the best comedians out there louis ck is is definitely one of the top ones but uh like take a look, like snl like uh, yeah but kate take McKinnon. a look at, you take a look at snl the top snl uh people right now kate mckinnon uh, leslie forget her last name Oh, yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking um, about. But even going back over the history, it was, uh, Kirsten Wig was the most recent huge success. Yeah. Like, all the ones that have been growing off Tina of Fey and uh, Tina Fey, Amy, Amy Poehler. Poehler um, and, um, and they've gone on to do great work, like yeah. Parks and Recreation. Maya with... Rudolph. Uh, yeah, she was a really good one. She was in Bridesmaids. Yeah. Like, it's only been women who have been kind of launching their careers out of SNL. Alyssa I, most of the men, are, yeah, Alyssa McCarthy. Just won an Emmy for Spicer impersonation. <laughs> like, <laughs> it was so good. Uh, like, they're running... Uh, comedy for us right now and yeah. they are so fucking funny like as, as a matter of fact all the guys on snl i don't even fucking know who they are no you're right yeah, yeah. yeah especially with snl like yeah it's been largely women being the standout for the last yeah. couple years and uh, fuck uh, kate mckinnon makes me laugh so much i love kate mckinnon kirsten weig makes me like, yeah, Kir- just explode she's hilarious. like fuck her interviews where she dresses up as different people and they pretend like they're like, like good god and they do this shit like i always find women with comedy and women with in writing and stuff they do shit in a perspective I've never seen before. I, f- I wonder, like, with these people, I you know, if Kristen Wiig is up up there doing a skit, I think they've predetermined they hate it. They're just gonna sit there with their arms crossed yeah. and like just loathe the thing and t- it through. What if she wrote it and males performed it though? Like, and you didn't know, would they laugh? Or do you? Or, or well, they found out they laughed later. Would they be like, no, it wasn't that good though? Well, here's you know? an example though, right? Like they didn't know they didn't click in that women being hired and, and uh, working on Rick and Morty. They've all been sitting back going, best season of Rick and Morty so far, and then they found out the women were liked it, and now they don't like it. Or women wrote it, now they don't like it. Yeah, it's like, just, it's just like, how can you exist? Are, is this just 15-year-olds? like, Or is it people who are like our age, which is even more sad, you know? I think the sexism thing is more our age. That's, yeah, it's so yeah. fucked to me. Because, like, the stupid, uh, like, bullying, gamer, like, uh, trolly, stupid shit, like, yeah, that's the 15-year-olds. Uh, the, the hate comments and stuff like that. Like, no person in their 30s who has a full-time job has enough time to even care about writing out something that they hate enough online. Let's hope. Let's hope. At least the majority. Like, by this point in your life, you're just like, I'm too fucking tired to even care. Well, I mean, we're this age and we're doing a podcast about things we like and hate. Yeah, but 
we're proactive. <laughs> <laughs> we are. We're that yogurt that Jamie Kennedy stars in. Not Jamie Kennedy. <laughs> Jamie Kennedy. Jamie Lee Curtis. <laughs> Jamie. <who? laughs> Jamie Kennedy. Jamie Kennedy is that shitty comedian who. Uh, he had the X Factor. No, not X Factor. X Factor. No. He had that like show that was kind of like punked. You got pranked. And, yeah. he, and he was always like, you got, like, x And he was, like, oh, yeah, yeah. arm. Oh, fuck. And he was in, like, I yeah. that guy. Yeah, he sucks. <laughs> 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 Jamie Kennedy did not endorse yogurt. That was Jamie Lee Curtis. Yes. Who's also back to star in Halloween uh, the, that's coming up next year. Which is awesome. Yeah, which is fantastic. I miss Jamie Lee Curtis, don't you? I love it, yeah. Same me. Uh, same. It's like, fuck, uh, True Lies. Yep. So good. Um, and I, I, Fuck, I could go through the list. But, yeah, I fucking love Jamie Freaky Lee Curtis. Freaky Friday. Another Freaky seminal Friday. classic. Um, hey, she was good in that. No, yeah, she's great. Um, to counterbalance L- Lindsay Lohan's... Uh, and that kind of actually, like, will bleed into our next story a little bit. Because um, she's returning for Halloween, and Halloween yeah. seems to be disregarding anything that happened after Halloween 1, I yeah. think. I, I think it's... Th- that's just becoming a trend now. Wasn't there a second one with Jamie Lee Curtis in it, though, for Halloween? <sighs> Wasn't there? But she's older, and he she, came back? Oh, she came back for H2O. H2O. Yeah, when she was older. Yeah. H2O sucked. Yeah. It was bad. It was that's bad. one of the ones that... Because with Friday the 13th and Halloween... I cannot keep them straight. I have no idea. Unless I went in on a marathon and watched them all now, I would not be able to dis- like, you're like, which one was this killing? I'd be like, I have no fucking idea. Except for the first one with Halloween. I remember Halloween 1. Yeah. But other than that, yeah, it's, it's so hard to keep track of. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, Arnold, Schwarzen- Arnold Schwarzenegger has come back to Terminator 6. Terminator 6 is going to disregard anything after Terminator 2. Yep. Also, what's her face who played, uh, I got it, Linda Hamilton. Linda Hamilton. Linda yeah. Hamilton's coming back. Uh, yeah, and it's going to describe everything after Terminator 3. Or, well, ter- it started describing Terminator 3 and on. Yeah. Which is awesome. It's totally awesome and amazing to start I feel like again. a bunch of people who were, like, our age who watched these movies growing up are coming to power, and they're being like, no. <laughs> <laughs> no to all this. But keep this. These were good. Yeah. Well, but it's, it's moving. It's got It's like be. the alien thing, right? Well, I was just talking about this with my partner, actually, was uh, how I think now uh, our generation are coming into the positions of power, whereas watching that stuff out... So uh, they're coming. It's like I was talking about with anime, right? Like mm. the anime fans haven't gotten old enough to take over and and write anime for North American audiences. Uh, this is the example of that. Like you know, we're wiping out uh, Neil uh, Blomkamp's Like, oh no, fuck everything after Aliens Two yep. didn't happen. Everything after Terminator Three didn't happen. All that shit you went through for the last twenty five years. No, like nope. No, exactly. Yes, yeah, it's, it's fucking awesome. But that's not why we're here to talk about Arnold Schwarzenegger today. Oh, we are here to talk about Arnold Schwarzenegger. Filming the sequel to Twins, Triplets, <laughs> after he's done Terminator 6. I found, I found the story and I just I found I the story stopped in my tracks. And I was like, what? Yeah. A sequel set to the 1988 comedy Twins, titled Triplets, has been in the works for a number of years and is set to once again star Arnie alongside Danny DeVito. Only this time, Eddie Murphy will reportedly be along for the ride as the original pair's long-lost brother. This sounds like a movie that would come out in 1989. Yeah. It sounds like the sequel that should have happened in 1989. It doesn't sound like a sequel that come out now. So they're doing it right. Because Eddie Murphy hasn't been in a movie since, what? Shrek? Oh yeah. I was going to say Do a Little 2. Yeah, but <laughs> or something. Shrek. No, he had that one really, he had that really bad movie, actually. Remember? Yeah, the one where he's in space. Is that it? Uh, yeah. The, the Adventures of Pluto Nash. That's it. No. Yeah. He had one that was 2001 that. or something. No, he had something else after that. that he had like cool. the clumps after that. Oh, fuck, so many bad movies. He has so many bad movies. So many bad movies. But Eddie Murphy coming back to do this is like... Yeah, that's exactly what would have happened in 1989. They'd be like, who's the hottest comedian right now? Andy Murphy, get him on! Like, yeah. <laughs> Although, I'll be curious to how they tackle the fact that one of the boys is African-American. I'm sure there will be a, a funny dialogue about them just looking at him and be like, you're our brother. Like, <laughs> 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 uh? Uh? Tim Allen shows up. I'm here what too. What was the thing with twins, though? Like, Danny DeVito was the shitty one that was like a little mutant baby and he was good? <laughs> <laughs> like, what's the story? The products of a genetic experiment, fraternal twins Julius, Arnold, and Vincent, Danny DeVito, are separated at birth. Their mother, Mary Ann, is told they're dead. (laughs) Now Vincent, an unscrupulous street hustler, ekes out a living in Los Angeles. Julius, raised by a scientist, grows up humble, intelligent, and strong, but very naive about the larger world. When Julius learns of his mother and brother, he heads to Los Angeles to find his family. So... So maybe this is just Eddie Murphy's fucking journey to find his... His, like, genetically altered brothers yeah. like i guess or something it starts out like a marvel movie and then becomes yeah. every other comedy <laughs> <laughs> so yeah like i was right danny devito's just a little shitty one like the the tumor one that got removed <laughs> <laughs> he's he, he's that thing he's quaid like yeah. on, on the chest from total recall <laughs> this is actually just the future of total recall <laughs> when when um you know, quater, quaid <laughs> 
It's uh, Quato, isn't it, or something? Is the, that the that's the name of the little thing comes out, and he just got removed instead. <laughs> I'm finally free. Oh, fuck. Daniel DeVito playing that tumor would have been great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's move on to some Justice League news. Report. Current Justice League cut doesn't feature Lex Luthor. Good job, Joss Whedon. <laughs> good job. Good job, Joss Whedon. You're taking this all... Like, this movie might actually turn out good. Justice League has plenty of eyes on it right now, and some select fans got to see them in the film this week. Reports have surfaced that Warner Brothers held its first test screening for <laughs> Joss Whedon's first cut of the film, and Batman News is reporting one character has been snipped from Justice League. Spoiler, the villain is very bald. According to Batman News, the site says it can confirm the current cut of Justice League does not include Jesse Eisenberg Lex, L- Lex Luthor scenes. The site, which claims to have spoken with three fans who attended the screening, shared the news on Twitter. Oh, thank God. So that's, yeah, whatever. That, that's basically the, the crux of it. No, but that's that's just, like, thank God, though, right? Like he I like that, like, instead part. of even trying to rework it or, like, making his role very minimal, mm. they're just like, fuck it. <laughs> I like the statement it makes, too, that Joss Whedon would come along and he was just, like, like looking at the, the movie like, fucking Jesus Christ. And then just, I'm going to let the world know that that was actually shitty <laughs> and you can all agree. Just, <laughs> like, the blade came down. And He's like, how many months do we have until we have to release? I don't know, that, that few. We're doing all the reshoots. <laughs> yeah, we're doing, like, they're, they're like building a set two weeks ago, like yeah. a new set. So, yeah. Joss Whedon has definitely gone in and like looked at what I can't, I can't imagine. The thing, like his first, his first comment on this whole thing was like he was like, "I'm just getting this thing over the finish line." And every news story that's come out after that is basically like, "I've reshaped this from clay." <laughs> like, yeah, like he's. No, <laughs> I think he threw out the whole fucking thing. Like it, it has to be because. I, I can't even imagine what the film was that um, Zack Snyder. Zack Snyder had actually done. You know, like all of the uh, the what do I want to say? compassion for him and his loss and everything like that, and not any saying anything on that comp- component. I mean, him as a movie maker. Yeah, that must have been a really shitty movie. Because like, <clears throat> probably Joss Whedon's a competent director, but if he was told to come in and just like polish it up at the end, just get probably, it over, getting it over the finish line to yeah. me means like. Do the last few scenes and help them out. And that was it, probably getting... literally his thought when he got in. He was like, "Okay, I'm gonna come in and just get it over the finish line. Just give it that last little over." And he just walks in, and there's like murdered people on the floor. There's like a like a abandoned child who hasn't been cleaned in like weeks. Jeff and... Johns is like on the edge of dying. He's like malnourished. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just curled up beetle. <laughs> no, Superman, put it down. Put it down, Superman. <laughs> Things are on fire. <laughs> and he's like, oh my. <laughs> There's an entire, like, roaming, raving gang of just, like, extras running Wild around. Wild dogs. Yeah, yeah. they're feral. <laughs> they're feral. They're feral extras. <laughs> Where's the free coffee? <laughs> <laughs> Craft services left months ago. <laughs> <laughs> and Joss had to come in and clean it all up. And now it's this utopian paradise, apparently. Yeah, it, no, it's, cr- it's crazy how much stuff has come I- I'm I'm curious to see if anything comes out after this, like, when... Zack Snyder sees the film inevitably, and he's like, "That's not what I wrote," <laughs> or you know, like, and maybe in broad strokes, it's like, Justice League defeats a villain, <laughs> yeah. but you know, yeah. like everything else is like, he's like, "Oh," or it's just this one really awkward scene, like the whole movie is playing out nothing, just like the Avengers, right? Like total Justice League, the Avengers, and then this this right, and it switches over to like a full like weird Zack Snyder scene. Suddenly, like Wonder Woman punches someone through the head, and then mm. just goes back, and you're just like, "What was that?" That was a remnant of Zack Snyder. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I'm going to be curious to see that when it comes out. Just because, like, after all this, like, reshooting and cutting and, like, is the final product going to be good after he's tampered with it so much? Did he have enough time to really execute on what Joss Whedon wanted to do now at this point? You know? If anyone could, it's him. Just simply based on the fact that uh, he's worked in TV and worked on those kind of deadlines before mm-hmm. and turned this stuff around. Um, also, I always find that, like, when Joss Whedon's... So, like not not reined in um held in a box i guess is the word because mm. like if you look at buffy it was struggling with budget and struggling with like uh, tv as a medium to try and convey this massive story he was trying to, to make um and he made it blossom inside of that mm. uh, firefly was his attempt at making something that had never been done before with tv it was like an hbo show and the netflix shows before it ever happened decade before it ever happened and he worked with that, and it failed because of time slot, but still he succeeded because he was inside of that, that box mm. that he couldn't get out of. And even then, Avengers, like, people were not refining... Because he, in a very large sense, defined every single fucking superhero movie ever since. As soon as the Avengers came out and there were jokes in it, it was suddenly jokes had to be a thing. There were, yeah, there was a major tone shift. <clears throat> there was a major tone shift, and everyone's followed the Avengers as a, as a model ever since. Yep. 
Um, so, like, Seriously, yeah, I, I mean, I've, there's a quote from somebody, I have no fucking idea, so if it's your quote, write in, but no, <laughs> um, uh, restrictions breed creativity. Yeah. You know? So I feel like with this, when he's stuck with so little time, apparently infinite budget, though. Yeah. Um. <laughs> I'm making three new sets. Yeah. We only have, we have to release this in three months, I don't care. <laughs> you can just, just hire more people, or in the words of Louis C.K., everything great that's ever happened in, in uh, humanity is just by throwing more pain, pain and death <laughs> yeah. and suffering at it. Yes. He's just got, like, whips and slaves. Um, but yeah, I think that that will mean that the product he's going to produce is going to be strong let's hope so i hope so because i can't I, I we'll hit on the wonder woman review later but yeah okay next up uh, a little bit of marvel news defenders is marvel and netflix's least watched out of the out of those not like the least watched thing on the fucking all no. of netflix no. but out of daredevil jessica jones luke cage iron fist defenders was late at least that makes total sense to me because we started off with daredevil we all fell fucking in love it was amazing daredevil season two was amazing jessica jones was was great yeah um it was a little slower but it was still fantastic and it's actually one of my i think my number one but then you get luke cage and you're just struggling to get to the end of it because he spends like four fucking episodes injured mm. and it's slow uh it was not bad in any context the first half of it was actually quite good um what's her name who plays black mariah was excellent um, but then you get into uh, fucking Iron Fist, and you're like, oh. And now you, you have to reinvigorate our faith in it. But after two seasons of losing ourselves over all of these mm. many episode, very long, slow shows, you have to reignite our passion for it. And I, I thought did... Defenders would, though. Because like, I'm pretty sure every one of these shows that have come out, like Daredevil did like Netflix's biggest numbers mm-hmm. ever. Then Jessica Jones beat that. Mm-hmm. And then Luke Cage beat that. And even Iron Fist beat that. Mm-hmm. And it was uh, I was like... Yeah, for sure, Defender's going to do... He's going to beat that. I thought, even with Iron Fist being as poorly received as it was, I thought people, with these four finally coming together, it was still it was going to be, like, the biggest one. It's just, again, it's it's, a, it's an amalgamation of the two things, right? We, we got kicked in the nads with uh, uh, Luke Cage to Iron Fist. But then, at the same time, superhero burnout is definitely a thing right mm-hmm. now. And uh, we're definitely oversaturated. Inhumans failed. Uh, the fucking Warner Brothers DC stuff just keeps spinning off into spinoffs and other stories and adding new heroes every five minutes. Um, there's Legion, which was good, but still another show. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> the list just keeps going. <clears throat> and there's the stuff with this fucking Spider-Man shit that's coming up and God knows what else is happening with all of that. Yeah. Like, we're just like, fucking Jesus. And this show comes out and basically tries to say it's going to be a six-hour Avengers where you're like, guess what? They finally united. Um <laughs> Like, I'm not that excited about that anymore. Mm. Like, give me something more. Give me something more interesting to be excited about. Yeah, I'm just, again, surprised it's the least. I would have thought, it, you know, I, I would have thought I had enough people, even if they only watched, like like me, only watched Daredevil and Jessica Jones, they would have yeah. jumped on and been like, okay, yeah. I'm in. Like, no. But at the same time, like, I mean, if I think about it in this way as well, like, uh, Jed watched it, he watched it from beginning to end with me, he enjoyed the series through and through, but he said he felt very lost, because actually there's a lot from fucking Iron Fist that you need to know. I heard it was very heavy on Iron Fist. Uh, And and Like, it runs entirely on him in this component. It was like their attempt to revitalize him. I think they need to stick him in the background. Yeah. It's such a shame. I like Iron Fist a lot as a character in the comics. They had one scene... Of using him since the day they started the first show, where he was actually Danny Rand and Iron Fist, and that's the restaurant scene in the Defenders. That scene is Danny Rand being Iron Fist. Yeah, and it was fantastic. And that whole scene is like that episode. I'm like, fucking yes, we we got it, we we nailed it, keep it up. And then suddenly it 180 itself near the end of the series. <sighs> Depressing. Yep. Yeah. Let's get into some gaming news. Games, games. Uh, TGS this year, TGS 2017, the Tokyo Game Show, <laughs> the Tokyo game show <laughs> sorry i was checking if the recording was still working um <laughs> i thought that was your gears your head working away you're just like i'm gonna make a joke no <laughs> it failed <laughs> no was only watching to see if the uh the audio was spiking okay buddy <laughs> yeah so the take the tokyo game show is well currently happening right well while we're recording this uh although i think all of the major uh press release stuff has happened and yeah. it's all just gone down to public uh access um, and actually, this is one of the more impressive Tokyo game shows, because last year I didn't have a single thing I wanted to report on. So. No. There's, like, three things here that I liked. Yeah. Yeah. Which is... Which is nice. Nice. Like, nice. that there's something... Like, usually every Tokyo game show comes along, and everyone's like, Tokyo game show! And I'm like, what do they even talk about? Um, so the first thing, the biggest thing, uh, probably, is Left Alive, which was, uh, from Square Enix. Yeah. And a, a very different from, looking game for them. There's a lot from Square Enix this year, actually. Uh, yeah. They did two, at least two of them are fucking... Three. Are all three of the things we like from Square? Yeah. No, Monster Hunter. Oh, okay. Um, (laughs) (laughs) 
Um, so the title, if you haven't seen it, go watch the trailer. Uh, the title, uh, which Square Enix describes as a brand new survival action shooter, is set in a dark and gritty world. I feel like we're really impressed with the release from 2007. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's being directed by ar- <laughs> armored. So it's being directed by an armored core director, uh, Toshifumi Nabashima, and features character designs by Metal Gear character designer Yoji Shinkawa, mech designer Takuya Yanase, who worked on Metal Gear and Xenoblade Chronicles X, and is also is also involved in the project. Uh, a teaser showcasing the game's futuristic setting is shown during the press conference. Blah blah. blah. Anyways, it looks like this might be since we're I mean, you know since we're not getting Metal Gear from Kojima anymore. We might be getting another Metal Gear game. Yeah, but from everyone else but Kojima. Yeah. <laughs> but, like, all these guys have good pedigrees. Obviously, the uh, Metal Gear character designer, Yoji Shinkawa, yeah. is fucking fantastic. I've always loved the art that he does for yeah. all the all the Metal Gear concept stuff. Oh, Yoji stuff. Shinkawa is fucking genius work. We've talked about him before on our top concept artists. Like, he has such an instantly recognizable style. Oh, yeah. You're like, it's oh, one that's, of a kind. Yeah, you're like, that's yeah. Metal Gear. Yeah. And he's all, He reminds me of the dude who does the logos for... Uh, uh, the Final Fantasy games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, I yeah, yeah. His name, but... And he just did that whole splash page that we came up with fifteen too. Yeah, um, I forget. He has that. It's just that distinguished. Like when you see that, you're like, yeah. "That's Metal Gear" or "That's Final Fantasy." Yeah, you know and that I mean? style like... was very heavily used for Final Fantasy three or six. Um, they also, uh, yeah, and they actually drew on it for Final Fantasy nine as well. Mm-hmm. But uh, you know, it, it it doesn't have the refinement. It looks like as per. Uh, Metal Gear, it looks a little bit more rough around the edges, I'd say. Yeah, it's hard to tell right now. I mean, yeah. we've got a very, very short, but it's something I want to keep my eye on. Yeah, and, you know, you know, I'm, I'm always down for another really good like mech show. Yeah, like a, it, like it seems like it's leaning way heavier on mechs than yeah. uh, uh, Metal Gear does, even though Metal Gear is about Metal Gears. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the part that always got, that's the part that always got me about uh, Metal Gear was like, yeah, at the end of the day, every last boss fight was against the Metal Gear. Yep, but. Like, that's why you called it that? Because, like, you, he, he didn't spend his time going after people who were making Metal Gears, except for in the second one, I think. No, the first one. The first I mean, one. he's always going to stop the Metal Gear. It makes yeah. sense that it's called that. It's just that, like, most of the drama going around it is all this, like... It's all it's everything else. It's Big Boss. Do you think love can bloom on the battlefield? Yeah. Shit like that, and you're like, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, whatever. And also, at the same time, every single time a Metal Gear shows up, usually there's some sort of super-powered, genetically altered super agent that can drop one. Always. <laughs> Always. Like, it's it's one, like, man, why it's is one man with a pistol yeah, <laughs> taking like, out this fucking lizard nuclear launching device. Yeah, and I'm like, why did you bother with the Metal Gear? Apparently you have enough genetic technology to make, like, Superman. Yeah, you could just make these soldiers and that'd be way better. Yeah. Or, like, you made Raiden, why didn't you just make a lot of them? You know? Exactly. <laughs> but I'm still very excited for this. Plus, the, the, you're right, the pedigree of the people involved should make something pretty cool. And it's, yeah, it's cool that Square Enix is doing this, you know? Yeah. Right? Like, it's like, oh, you guys are really, like, stepping outside the box. Well, that's the part of what, I mean, over the whole Tokyo Game Show and coming up for, like, the next game thing we're going to talk about uh, is I have this feeling, like, whenever we talked about the Square Enix Collective coming out and Square Enix saying we're going to start focusing going back to our old 1990s grooves of releasing these really strange games that come just, like, out of nowhere. You're like, what the fuck? And this is a Square Enix game? And then... We sit here 20 years later going, every game I played in the 90s was a Square Enix game. Because it was just all those weird random games. Basically. Yeah. So one of the other ones that came out was uh, very interesting. Project Octopath Traveler. It looks super cool. Looks super cool. Yeah. Uh, if you haven't seen a trailer for it, go do it, If you, even if you just like art. Like... <laughs> No, yeah. It, no, it's, it's a good way of putting it, if you just like art. It's dope, because it, it has a like a sprite-based 2D style for the characters, but the the worlds are 3D, but still kind of rendered in that way. Yeah, rendered in like a 2D way. Uh, th- sorry, a 3D way, but with a pixel art edge. It looks like something that would HD 2D or something? Yeah, they, they said, like, we're calling it HD 2D. Which I'm fine. If they're, they Actually, Square Enix, once again, as per usual, they were masters of art, right? Their games always explored visual art mediums in ways that no other, none, no other did. Like... Star Ocean, and it's like illustrative isometric style, and it's live action com- combat, Secret of, uh, Legend of Mana, and Secret of Mana. Uh, the first 3D RPG was Final Fantasy VII. Uh, Z- uh, Xenogears, where it did the like push button combo uh, 2D with 3D mech uh, uh, game. Like, they always push the edges in that way, but they haven't done that in forever. They just kept making fucking more Final Fantasies. Um, and but this is done by the people who did Barely Default. Which is an amazing game. And uh, Project Octopath Traveler, you get to choose from one of eight characters, and I guess they all have storylines that are going to intertwine. Yeah. So you have to pick who you want and go through. And I'm assuming each one's going to be like, I don't want to say short, but like 
short shorter for an RPG, but like the game itself, you want to play all eight characters, it's probably gonna be pretty fucking long. I wonder if they're gonna do it. There's another RPG that used to do this back did this one back in the day. It was like you had all those characters and then you played each one in segments and then as the story progressed eventually they started the cross. You know, and yeah. then you just kept bouncing between them as the stories evolved. So like you'd play for four hours on one character, then it would force you over to the other character after a bit. It could, yeah. yeah. It's it's hard to say. But each character has like a, a different ability. Like there's a dude who's a he's a knight or something, mm -hmm. and you can just it sounds like you can duel anyone in the game. Yeah. Like anybody. So that that might be good for him. You might be able to get a lot of experiences that guy, get the extra items. Yeah. If someone's in your way, I thought this was cool that you could if there's a guard in your way, you can just duel him and yeah. be like, yeah, fuck off. Like, yeah. I, I'm gonna, I need you out of my way and fight him. Yeah. Um, the, the dancer who can uh, allure, so like, she, apparently she just wiggles at them or something. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Like, she just goes up and says allure and then like, you win. Um, and then that person will follow you so that you can get people out of the way again, but also like, recruit them as party members or call them at some point later on. Yeah, and I'm sure different characters are gonna have different things you can do with them. There's yeah. probably some secret character who like, finds items for you or something, yeah, you know, exactly. shit like that. Um, it, this all... You know, this from you called me crazy for this idea mm -hmm. before, where I said that I would I would love if Square all of a sudden it was like, Final Fantasy sixteen is like, basically a game like this. Yeah. And they just released it like randomly, and then they're like Final Fantasy seventeen is going to be more like fifteen or whatever. Yeah. But like sixteen is this weird random sprite based game. Like this is exactly what I've been wanting. Project yeah. Octopath Traveler is like, it looks like it's harkening back to the days, but with like, a fresh take on a battle system and like these new just like things you can do in the game, the yeah. mechanics. But this is what I was talking about with the collective and where Squeenix was going with that whole uh, idea, right? Where they were, like, talking about going back to it finally and finally really exploring it. They said, like, I Am Setsuna was the start of that. And it was a good game, but I found it a little bit repetitive and boring. Um, but, uh, you know, this is this is it. Uh, the moment... This is, yeah. You, you, you turned this on for me when I showed up, and uh, I would, they didn't even show anything but just characters walking on a path. And I was like, I need to play this right now. It's true. Yeah. And I'm like, I haven't bought a Switch yet, I've been putting it off, and then, like, this is on a Switch, uh, which is a perfect Switch game. It does, yeah, that's the thing, too. It looks like it's perfect for the Switch, like, I'm, I cannot wait for this game. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm running out for it. This, I'm getting a Switch now, and I'm gonna just make sure I have one so I can play this. And the, and the crazy thing is, is this got announced with, like, a mini trailer, like, back when the Switch got revealed, I yeah. think, late last year. Yeah. And I was, I was like, hmm. Like, I was just kind of, eh, yeah. whatever. And I was like, that's a silly name. But, like, that was all I thought about it, and now I'm like... This is fucking dope. Like, yeah. So uh, yeah, it I, gives me so many vibes. It gives me Thread of Fate vibes. It gives me fucking Suikoden vibes. It gives me uh, classic Final Fantasy vibes. Yep. It gives me Wild Arm vibes. Oh yeah, a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. like all yeah. The so classic if, you, if you haven't seen it and you're an RPG fan, go and Google Octopath Traveler. You won't get any porn, I'm sure, because who the fuck would type that in ever? I'm sure. Nah, uh, you know what? Maybe now there's probably <laughs> someone who's like got these two sprites fucking. Yeah. Oh no, but even then you could put like Octopath porn in. I'm sure it's got something. You're probably right. We'll try that after the break. <laughs> uh, and the other thing that Mike and I are uh, potentially excited about yeah, is Monster Hunter World. It's uh, developed looking a lot more interesting. Yeah. Uh, it got a release date of January 26th, 2018, which is a pretty good date. Mm -hmm. It's early in the year. Not a lot of stuff's going to be coming out uh, that might actually get us to play it. Yeah. Um, what would you... You had a lot more thoughts on it than me. What you... <laughs> uh, well, no, it's just the weird part. It's like, I still don't feel enticed to have to play because, like, I'm, I'm also very curious about, like, how much of the online component is required. Can you solo this game? But there was some seriously interesting stuff that we didn't see executed in all the demos we were watching before, right? Uh, we watched that whole, like, Tyrannosaurus Rex uh, combat uh, footage from it. But, like, they said that, oh, when you're, you're fighting, then another monster could come up and do something. And in the beginning of the trailer for the, uh, the gameplay demo information for this one, uh, they just like, oh, another monster showed up and started biting it. And I'm like, all right, whatever. But then when they're chasing it down, like, you've cut off its tail. It's actually missing its tail and its pieces. And then it ran away from you because it was hurt. Yeah, like, and then you're started, chasing it over the world. Yeah, and then you're, you're actually having to, like, you're a hunter. You're not just monster finder. You're, yeah, <laughs> like you know, you're a hunter. You had to hunt this thing down and chase it down. After the thing you is, I, I'm not sure the single player is going to be that fulfilling, you know what I mean? Yeah, that's the thing. I, I, I assume it'll just be like, you're doing this but alone. You yeah. Know? Like, then it might not be as yeah. great as if we were playing like online together or something. And then like monsters would pop up. But it was interesting, like that one ran off and then there was a slug monster that actually literally did wrap itself around. I love that they're one. interacting. It's not just like two bite animations yeah, happening at each other or something. It's yeah. just like, this thing actually physically wrapped itself around it. Give me like Kong Skull Island vibes of like, yeah. these massive fauna just like yeah. clashing. I did also like seeing some of the stuff for the combat uh, uh, mechanics in it. Like, uh, the girl was using uh, double two or dual daggers, and uh, like one of her attacks was like she did basically fucking um, 
uh, the spin attack from uh, Attack on Titan that Levi does, like the yeah, yeah. of the whole thing. And I was like, hey, cool. So like th- these these combat mechanics you're having with them, they're they are interactive. You're not there is clearly a heavy hack and slash component of this where you're just like swinging at a leg for like ten minutes. Yeah. But there are attacks and stuff that each of these weapons did that was like very interactive to the shape of the monsters. So I didn't just feel like I was whacking at it the whole time. And a lot of the designs are really cool. And the, the monster designs are really cool. Plus uh, the different weapons now, seeing them in, in action was very interesting. Like there's a horn that gives buffs to people, and like it, as you press your combo attacks for those horn in different button combinations. It gives different buffs and different orders and stuff to keep everyone going. Yeah, and like I, all I've been hearing is positive impressions coming out of the demos people yeah. are playing. Like they said, like this is the time I'm going to jump on Monster Hunter. So yeah. maybe we will too. Maybe we will too. Yeah, this there, is definitely uh, this is definitely a game. If one of us buys it, the other one has to. Yeah, we're going to play online. Yeah, and no, we'll, we'll sure. make our monster raid parties. Is this on Switch? No, uh, no, or it might be, but uh, it's, it's PS4 or an Xbox. Okay, well, probably. Okay, so you're good. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll play it online because yeah, yeah I, I I am curious, and that does seem like a pretty good time. I'd be pretty dry in January. Pepsi's a big fan of this. Uh, no, he's not. He's not. Uh, no. Oh. He's interested in this one, but he's not like he's never played one before. Oh, I thought he was. No, yeah. anyway. But still, I mean, the more people you get, the better, right? Yeah, of course. Um, the thing is, I, I said this to you before the podcast, games like this always give me existential crisis. Yeah. When any, any game with loot at all, yeah. eventually I just get to the point of like, why am I here? Why am I doing this? <laughs> what does this all mean? <laughs> I like the loot grind. I, 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 I like... do. It's super addictive. I'm, I'm, I'm addicted as anybody, but I, I think I always feel like I hit that wall more than other people. Oh yeah. Like the, the, the full final capping, I get into that, that point as well where I'm just like, I, but I lose it not in like, what am I doing with my life <laughs> as much as you do. <laughs> Which is a good one to think of before all of that. <laughs> but mine is, like, I was when I was playing WoW, and I, I had gotten, like, the Tier 2, uh, like, r- r- not Raid. I mean, at the time of uh, fucking Cataclysm and stuff like that. It wasn't Raid gear. You, you could get it by just running the dungeons. but um, Or the Heroic Dungeons. Um, but I had that, but there were two more sets above that, and the only way to get the top one is to run the, like, 20-man Raid groups and stuff like that. And I was just like, fucking don't. No, like, I, I don't need that. I don't need that at all. It That's just right. looks slightly different. No, and my, my thing is I just always hit a wall once you start capping out, and you're like, well, we're going to keep grinding, but for what? Well, we're going to get the better item so we can beat the boss, but we can already beat the boss. We're yeah. beating that boss to get the item. What is the point? What is the point? What are we going to do? Yeah, and once we get it! Ah! <laughs> and even, even with something like Destiny, it's like, well, there's two months until the next content thing comes out, and I'm, I'm like... I'm not playing this straight for two months, and then by then I've just like fallen off it completely. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm not going back. But even then, the part that gets me too, it's like you get they're like, oh, if you get this raid gear, then you can beat the the, the boss and the expansion easier because you have the better raid gear. And you're like, no, the monsters that come out are so strong, you need the gear in that dungeon to beat it. Yeah, yeah, so, exactly. Like, what so you're no doing matters. now, it doesn't actually help. <laughs> Anyways, Monster Hunter World looks great. Uh, aside from existential crisis, yeah. uh, Shadow Class PS4 trailer drop. Didn't watch it. Don't care. Final Fantasy IX for PS4. Fantastic. Finally, heard, they heard all our shouting. I don't yeah. know why it took so goddamn long. <laughs> uh, like I said to Mike on text, I was like, I was like, I don't know when I'm going to get a chance to play this game because October is so packed. Yeah. I, but like, it's sitting on my hard drive right now and I'm itching to play it. Like, And I know if I start it, I'm just going to skip everything in October. <laughs> I'm just going to be like, this is the only game I'm playing until I'm done it. Well, that might not be a bad thing. No, no, exactly. That's the thing. I'm like, is it, is it a bad thing? Maybe not. Maybe not. Uh, Zone of the Enders, uh, the second runner remastered with VR supports coming out. Uh, that's from Konami, surprisingly. They're still doing video game stuff. Crazy. <laughs> Who cares? Noctis joins Final Fantasy Dissidia. I'm still curious as to whether or not I actually want to play Dissidia. I don't know something about it, though. It's like, do I want to play it in a non-mobile sense? You know, yeah, I don't want really... to sit down on a console and play it. I want to play it mobily. Yeah, that would be a good Switch one. Yeah. Dragon's Crown confirmed for PS4. Is it on, oh, it's on a Switch? No, oh. not as far as I know. Fucking tease. Uh, Japanese Japan Studio VR Musical Festival. No one cares. Yes. Nico Atsume cat collecting sim coming to PSVR. Mm-hmm. People like cats, people like VR. Sounds yeah. like a good combo. <laughs> uh, and that was TGS. Uh, though, yeah, so three standouts that I, I, we're really liking. Yeah. And the last bit of newsy news is Android 21. <laughs> From Dragon Fighters, or Fighter Z, I don't know how the fuck you say it. Dragon uh, Fighter Z? Yeah, the Dragon Ball Fighter Z, the Dragon Ball Z fighting game uh, coming out. Uh, Akira Toriyama, creator of Dragon Ball, uh, has designed a character specifically for the game called Android 21. Um, if you haven't seen her, go Google her. I'll give you a second. Wow. How underwhelming was that? <laughs> um, so, uh, th- th- this is an article about how Akira Toriyama designed Android 21. The, 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 uh, I mean, I, mean I, get, I get it at one point. Like, yeah, so first, yeah, what are your impressions of Android 21? 
So, like, I get it. With Toriyama's designs, they're always like this. It's always, like, this really random shot from the left side kind of stuff. Like, the androids first showed up, and you're like, oh, they're going to be like robots, but then they just look like people. Yeah. Um, and there's nothing special about them looking whatsoever, and you never actually see a robotic part ever except with the first ones. Yeah. Um, and even then, one of them is, is, like, why did he design one that was fat and, and white? Like, what was... Yeah, the, fat white doll thing. Like, what, like, the only one that looks like that. It's true. They all yeah. have the same eye <laughs> eye thing. Like, they have slightly different eyes than the rest of it. Because yeah. if you look at Kiritori on designs, like, Goku's face, Gohan's face, Vegeta's face, yeah. Tien's face, almost all the males have Piccolo's face, even if you take out the green. Yeah. They're all, like, the same eyes exactly and nose and line, like, yeah. line for a mouth. It's it's the body shape and the head shape, not even the head shape, really hair shape that hair really shape. defines them. Yeah, um, the, the, the eye slant. Yeah, you're right. It's this is the, very Android seventeen and eighteen. Android seventeen eighteen. But I mean, like he's like, I'm designing a new character. When you sit down and design a new character, you think like someone's gonna sit down and concept out stuff and you come in and you'd be like, oh, how did he think of that? Instead, it was like, I don't know. He he just doodled a librarian. Well, okay, so and it was like that's an android now. It's tough, right? Okay, so like I'm thinking that like. Uh, a character I really like is Beerus from uh, Dragon Ball Super. That cat, that Egyptian cat god, that's way out of his style. Like that's you know true. what I mean? It it's way different. It's not something you're tip. You're. Uh, and you're I was interested in that character the moment the show started up again. I was like, hey, look, there's something that was different. Yeah, it, yeah. he looks different. He doesn't look like he fits in because he's a god of destruction, which we hadn't seen before in that show, and it makes sense that he kind of looks different. Mm -hmm. This looks like, you know, there's speculation abound. This could be the android's mother or something like that, or like you know, Doctor Jiro recreated his wife and the kid. The, I don't know who fucking knows, but it looks like the same head did, shape, did, did everyone, same eyes. Did everyone with this uh, show re not remember that robots are robots and don't give birth? So I think there's also a discrepancy with the translation. They're not actually androids. They're supposed to be like cyborgs. Yeah, cyborgs. I think okay. like they're called cyborgs in Japanese, but it got translated to android when they came over here. Is that true? Yeah. Okay, so that, that's yeah. I've, there you go. Yeah, there is discrepancy with, with that. I'm with it. I'm in now. Okay. Oh, okay, My yes. God, like, I thought it's like they're, they're all androids. I'm like, what? No, like, they're referred to as Cyborg 1718 in, uh, in, in Japanese, I think. But now it's just gone so far, they're not going to rename it here. It's not going to be like a Robotnik Dr. Eggman situation where they're like, we're calling them Cyborg 18, and people are going, no, fuck off. <laughs> uh, anyways, Android 21. Uh, even though the character was created for Namco, by Nam Namco Bandai for the game, the company explained how the character was designed by Dragon Ball creator Akira Toriyama. I asked why the Android 21 trailer read, Original character supervised by Akira Toriyama. Namco Bandai created the game's story and decided what kind of character Android 21 would be. We basically said what the character was, such as her gender and personality. Uh, we said what the kind of character we wanted, gave Toriyama the plot, and then he was able to freely draw the character. So he's basically being a concept artist. Yeah. That's, you know, you're giving details, you're whatever. Well, he didn't really concept anything. He just kind of sat down and was like, I saw a librarian today. <laughs> She's, she looks like Android 18 with different hair and bigger tits. Yeah. That, that's what she is. Yeah. But yeah. That, that's Toriyama's design methodology, like you just said. Yeah. Um, essentially, Namco Bandai created the framework, and within those parameters, Toriyama designed it, Android 21. Mm -hmm. He was just like, another Android, I guess. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, there were small things that were rejected or changed, such as saying that Freezer or Cell wouldn't say this, or some slight changes to how Goku would act. And that's basically his, the extent of his involvement. Well, at least he was involved. Yeah, I guess so. Um, I mean, definitely. Well, you didn't say your impression Did, when you first saw it. Your first like just kind of underwhelmed. Underwhelmed. It's neat to see a new design, I guess, but mm. like it, you know, one done by him. But like it was just kind of like. Eh. Yeah, but then also at the same time, you look at Dragon Ball Super, you're getting tons of new designs because they've got all these new characters. That's you know? true. I mean, it, like it fits. Like it fits in. Like I mean, if it's coming from that era of Dragon Ball Z, like if she was in the show at that time, you'd be like, oh yeah, that is another one of them. You yeah. know, it's not. It's not super standout. The red and blue dress is like whatever, fine. Like it's just not super unique looking. Yeah, I find it interesting about Toriyama's designs methodology is that all of them seem to uh, not know what century it is in design and fashion. Because like this one's it's very from, random. Like, fucking Austin Powers like seventies or sixties, <laughs> a little bit, you know. And then fucking nineties uh, uh, biker, I guess, for the other androids. Yeah, because yeah, yeah seventeen's got the bandana. Yeah, and like the high high top like yeah. pants and then Bulma is like from the 80s with like her like leg warmers and shit Bulma's outfit changes all the time yeah. they change her for different arcs yeah. she's the only one who gets updated but then like even some of the other girls from Dragon Ball were the same thing like mm. a lot of them were wearing the leg warmers and looked like the girls who used to be in the aerobic videos and yeah shit. early 90s shit yeah. And you're like what the fuck uh, like <laughs> no one like no one has a like a no one knows what time period it is they're all so confused 
the world is literally his brain. Just a large <laughs> amount of confusion where everyone's like, what year is it? Thing, What's going on? The thing, too, is like... Why is that a dragon? I think he comes up... Why are there dragons in that world? Yeah. There's just like dinosaurs. There's a dog as president. Yeah, there's like <laughs> a giant dinosaur that walks around and everyone's like building little tiny towns and fine. But then there's like literal like like Godzillas just yep. out in the side of... And everyone's fine. I was going to say something, but I forgot now. That's fine. That's fine. Dragon Ball Fighter Z. Look forward to it next year. Yeah. I didn't get into the beta, even though I tried. <laughs> very sad about that. I really wanted to play that it game. It looked very bitter for a sec. Uh, yeah, no, I signed up for it, and I was like, surely I'll get it. And then they're like, it's full. And I was like, nah. <laughs> of course it is. You fucking idiot. <laughs> All right, uh, stay tuned uh, next for After Dark, where we're going to do uh, Rick and Morty reviews and Wonder Woman, and talk about what we're playing. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. Go away. <laughs> and then come back. Welcome to the After Dark segment, where we talk about everything we've been watching, playing, reading, and diddling. <laughs> <laughs> always diddling. We're playing with our diddlers. Yeah, always, you always gotta diddle the diddle. <laughs> diddle my diddle. Was there anything you called, like, like, uh, like a weird word? Like, I remember when I was a kid, I'm pretty sure, like, I, I called penis, like, a dink. Like, like, and, like, I call people dinks now, I'm like, oh, yeah. you're a fucking dink, but, like... But dink is something else, that's, like, dumb, like, that's what it was for me. Yeah, but, like, I'm pretty sure when I was, like, you know, five, I'd be like, that's my dink. Uh, I don't know I, why. I called it a dicker. A dicker? <laughs> yeah. That's what everyone called it. It's like, you hurt your dicker? Yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't know. Yeah, there's childhood terms for these things. Like, and the word penis, when you find it out, is like the most hilarious thing you've ever heard in your life. <laughs> penis wasn't the funniest. I've never heard penis before. I mean, my parents weren't really pretty, like, prudy. I've, I've cock told... made me, like, just lose my shit. Cock? Yeah, yeah. cock was pretty funny for a long time. Yeah. I'm, I'm, like, smiling as I'm saying it now. <laughs> Um, I remember twat, I, I, twat made me lose my shit. Twat always sounded like um like a pretty thing to me. Like it's like a like you'd see a bird land on a twat. <laughs> like, like it's like it's like a beautiful leaf. Well, because I know what the it's visual. Like, it's like this bird just like did a little bath and has a little like droplets coming off of some chickadee and then it goes perches on a twat and it's like. Oh, that's a nice <laughs> when you say that, all I see is a vagina. <laughs> <laughs> it's like this nice little flower. It's like oh that's that's a good picture for National Geographic. That chickadee on a twat. I like twat because I remember when we were, learned the word, my sister thought it was so funny as well. So we were running around outside in the yard and stuff and going twat, 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 And everyone heard us and was like, what are you teaching your kids? You can't, you can't control what your kids fucking learn. No. That, I, I think I've told you a story before, but uh, Cheese Toast Kid, uh, famous on this podcast now. <laughs> um, Cheese Toast Kid is a kid I grew up with. Um, go back and listen, try to find the Cheese Toast story if you can. There's about 300 of them. Um, I told you about his first rendition, his drawing of a vagina, did I not? Yeah, the, we we did this on a podcast. Oh, did I? Okay. The circle with the, the it's waterfall. A, it's just a circle with a line through it. Yeah. So he so he's like cracking up. He's just like he's like he's like, do you want to see a vagina? And I'm like, okay. Like I don't know what's gonna happen next. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. You know, we're like six or seven. Yeah. And he's like he's like cracking. Up. He's like <laughs> he's like fucking cracking up. And he just, he like presents this piece to me, and it's like a circle with a line through it. And I'm just like, what? And he's like, yeah. And he's like still like like losing his mind. And then he draws another one. He's like, this is how they pee. And he like draws another circle. Draws two lines. And then has like water coming out the middle of them, and he's like, "That's it." And there's like this like waterfall, and I was just like, <laughs> "Like a dam had opened." Yeah, like a dam, exactly like a dam had opened, and I was just like, "Okay, well, I, this must be true." <laughs> like, like I don't know, I'm six. I, where did you find this out? He was not a very good artist. No, anyway, he's like it opens like a hatch, makes that sound whenever it opens. <laughs> yeah, like steam comes out. <laughs> Yeah, it was always so ridiculous now, especially looking back. I don't know why that's such a vivid memory for me. No. I guess it was my first experience with a vagina, and I was just like, I need to remember this. <laughs> <laughs> my fucking adult child brain. <laughs> it's like later on when you finally see when you're like, wow, was I wrong. Yeah, that is nothing like what <laughs> it was drawn for me. Um, all right, so... Uh, Way worse. First up, we're going to be reviewing the last two episodes of Rick and Morty. Uh, the Rick Lantis mix-up, or Tales from the Citadel, and Morty's Mind Blowers. If you haven't seen these two episodes, we're going to do spoilers. So go check the timestamps. I have them uh, in the show notes, as always. Uh, if you haven't seen him, you know, skip to the next thing, which is going to be a review of Wonder Woman. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's talk about uh, Tales from the Citadel. Yeah. They did a fake out in this episode. They yeah. uh, had Rick and Morty, and they were going to do the an Atlantis thing, and, yeah. and then all of a sudden they're like, bam, no. Yeah. It's it's Tales from the Citadel. It's the, it's the Rick Citadel being, like, rebuilt. Yeah. And it was, it was a clever idea of going back and exploring, like, the alternative Ricks, right? Because... And then I watch a lot of their panels they do at San Diego Comic Con and New York Comic Con and stuff like that they did for the season three mm. and even after it had released it. They had done some really fun panels. Actually, a really good one I recommend is checking out San Diego Comic Con's 
uh, the science of Rick and Morty with uh, Kyle Hill from The Nerdist. Oh, cool. It was really cool. They had, like, two, a physicist and a biologist, like, these ridiculous like, quadra PhDs on, and then Dan Harmon and um, the other guy. I forgot his name. The one who actually does the voice of Rick and Morty. Oh, Justin Roiland. Yeah, Justin Roiland. Um, and uh, they talk about the science behind uh, Rick and Morty and stuff. It's very good. I highly recommend it. But um, they talked on one of those panels about how, like, people come up and they're like, are you ever going to explore, like... Some of the fucking questions, like one of them came up, like in one of the pictures in the episode with Squanchy, like when they had the wedding. Yeah. There's a picture of them all together, Birdman, Squanchy, and and uh, Rick uh, in a band. Are we ever going to see them go back and do the band? And they're like, No, you you got it. Like they were in a band, in that picture, <laughs> right? Yeah. So this is a clever way of kind of going back and exploring that element. Like people are like go back to the Citadel of Ricks and explore what it's like there, and it did. Yeah. Well, they rebuilt it now that it got destroyed in the opener. Opener. Yeah. Season opener. Season opener. opener. Um. And, like, right off the bat, I just want to say that, like, I'm so stoked for the return of Evil Morty. Yeah. I, I only figured it out within the last, like, ten minutes of the episode. Really? I thought, I, right away. I, well, I, I didn't really think they were going to bring him back, and I was like... But then, like, when he had the picture or something, I was like, it's going to be Evil Morty. And then, like, at the very end, the song kicks in, and I was like, oh! I got goosebumps, and I was just like, it's happening! We're getting fucking Evil Morty's back! And then, like, it was just a brilliant episode. I the fucking second they it. said one was running for president, I was like, it's Evil Morty. He's oh. trying to take over the Citadel. I was so fucking stoked yeah i was it, it was such a good episode yeah like the the good rick uh with the like kind of corrupt cop morty was really mm-hmm. interesting uh then they're just going to the strip joint there's a like, cowboy morty is just yeah. like the strip thing. <laughs> and they're like you gotta worry about cowboy morty else. i love that in the culture of it was that there's there are no women there's nothing else but ricks and mortys right so as it devolved into a society like only the thing you could do is get other mortys it's and strip, then there's yeah. just like fucking weird washed out mortys in here like <laughs> You don't gotta worry about Cowboy Morty. He's not gonna say a thing. It just backs out. Yeah. Like, fucking off. It was so good. And the Stand By Me joke with the, like, the five, yeah. five Mortys that went out, and then one of them just, like, jumps in the pit. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, all the Stand By Me ones were good. Lizard, yeah. like, Lizard Morty and fucking... Like, it was always the fly stuff, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I always thought I was left-handed Morty. Maybe you should use your left hand to eat more vegetables. Like, that was, like, I cracked up that line. Yeah. Like, oh, fuck, it was good. <laughs> uh, yeah, what a, what a fantastic episode. Like, another like another great one this season where they just really knocked it out of the park. And again, look, I, I thought, like, I haven't, like, laughed at a lot of ones this season, but mm-hmm. the ones that I have, like, really gotten laughs out of have been some of the best in the series. It's so wildly, like, up and down for mm-hmm. comedy for me this season. Well, I gotta say, like, that's the thing I was thinking about was when they talked about this season coming out, again, in these panels, uh, they talked about it with... Uh, they spent more time on this and took longer to take it out because they wanted to spend and make it way better than it was before. And it is. It's far more clever because, like, if you think about the ad-lib episodes, which could have easily been a flop, right? Yeah. Uh, like... Justin Roiland talks like that all yeah. the time. Like, that's him. Like, when they sit around and they, they jam out what they're going to do, they sit around in a room and uh, they just, like, sit there and, like, say shit where they're just, like, fucking donkey and then, like, photography raptor. Yeah. You know? Um, and they even did like a little virtual tour once of their studio and the guy was walking around making weird jokes and like they made a joke about how Justin Roiland poops and pees on the floor in the corner of the office <laughs> and stuff like they are those people all the time so they just like were like we don't know what to do for this episode let's mm. just ad lib the whole thing and then animate it right this time they very carefully thought about it right like in our in the episode with uh, uh, the one where uh, sorry are we talking about Morty's mind blowers now uh, no so I'm going back over another episode uh, in the episode with, uh, the, in the newer season, um, where, with the, the Jerry episode. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, like, the small thing, like you said, right, like, he has one eye that's a cyborg thing, and then when he's reaching yes. for the fucking... The death perception. The death perception. He's, also, like, he's like, uh, uh, uh. Like, that little thing... Yeah, that was the really funny so thing. so fucking clever. <laughs> um, and you're right, like, in this one, again, in this episode, they did the same stuff. Yeah, it was fucking fantastic. Like, yeah. one of the best of the season. One of the, maybe one of my favorites overall. Mm. Uh, I, I, I just love the Evil Morty. And I love that he's coming back. And, like, I doubt we'll get him again this season, so it's going to yeah. be another thing for season four yeah. to keep looking forward to. Um, there's been a lot of fan theories going out there that Evil Morty is Rick's original Morty. Like, our Rick's original Morty. Yeah. And he's just been, like, so... This is actually an extremely plausible-sounding fan theory. Yeah, I think it's pretty, yeah, pretty spot-on. Yeah. Because, like, he went and he actually, like, fucked that one up so I mean, far. even if you watch the de- development of uh, the Morty we've been following this yeah. season, the main one, he's gotten a lot smarter. He knows how to work Rick's shit. He's, yeah. like, very, like, he's almost, like, he's very cynical about everything that's happened. He's yeah. just like, okay, like, I know what's going to happen. And and, and and at the same time, he's also uh, getting jaded to certain stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Like, he's watching, um, uh, oh, fuck, the sister. Summer. Summer. Uh, and her uh, kind of adopting her mother's worship 
of uh, Rick. Yeah. And like being like, don't do that, don't do that, and like take Hero back and being like, look, uh, you know, this is where our bodies are where buried. Where bodies are buried. Stuff, yeah. It's like everything sucks. Just come inside and watch some TV. <laughs> yeah. It's like you know, you gotta understand that this, this is not an okay thing. He's not a god. Um, but I also like the fact that with this Morty, which I think is gonna be an interesting little kind of twist to that, is now that they brought back Evil Morty, is within the first episode, right? Uh, our our Morty, uh, like the current Morty that's ours, not Evil Morty. Yeah. Um, has I think almost processed things better. So when uh, he go, they goes back into the actual citadel, and uh, he's like with the council of Ricks there, and he's like pointing out, he's like, you know, if you believe my Rick is dead. Uh, you know, you're, he's, he's coming he's, for you. He's alive and he's fucking coming for you. Yeah. Like it was in that moment where I'm like, oh, okay. So like, you know, you do have this hate relationship with him, but at the same time, there's this component uh, of you that has the actual respect. Like you haven't broken yet, which will be a, like an interesting kind of future juxtaposition between mm-hmm. him and Evil Morty. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, like all together, seeing the other Mortys too, like the culture of the, the Citadel of Rick, which was interesting about the Citadel or of Ricks was also. They made a class system where some Ricks were actually like downtrodden and pushed down on because like there was the one yeah. that, that like actually was in the factory just pushing a button. Like what Rick would let themselves become a button pusher? Yeah, exactly. You know? Like which is really... why Rick hates that that place. Yeah, it was interesting and it was like and it made us hate it. And so now we understand why the Citadel of Ricks are actually so, like who is more Rick? Our Rick is the most Rick. Yeah, he's yeah. the Rickest Rick. He's the Rickest Rick. Uh, but this then guy in the middle of us, super right. weird. Yeah. Are you done? You're good with that episode? Yeah, love yeah. that episode. Yeah, okay. that's all I have to say about it. All right. Next one was uh, Morty Mindblowers, which was the internet... Uh, inter- Interdimensional net. space cable. Uh, flip. Replacement. Replacement, which was kind of interesting because the ad said, we're doing interdimensional cable, and they cut it there, but instead, in the actual show, they're like, this is what we're doing instead of interdimensional yeah. cable. Uh, and this is also perhaps re- revealing why Morty's still okay, that Rick's been ripping... His memories out. out and even memories that Rick doesn't want him to have yeah like him like, fucking up the words uh yeah they were color-coded right like there yeah. was ones that like red morty ones. wanted gone there's yeah. ones that rick wanted gone and yeah so was... the blue ones were morty wanted gone the other ones i think they were purple uh were the ones where his family just sucks uh and then the red ones were the ones that rick wanted gone mm. yeah mm. and it was ones where like rick would say a word wrong or something so he didn't look into yeah, something where morty felt superior to him yeah. a little bit or like and yeah. that away from him and then uh, the ones of the family is like <laughs> she's given the Sophie's choice, and then she's just like summer instantaneously. <laughs> yes, yeah. And then he shows up. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty good. <laughs> that was good. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, like I liked all the little clip stuff going back over different stories, and also there was a fuck ton of uh, homage stuff for this one too, like going over Battlestar Galactica mm. and everything. Um, I really enjoyed this episode. I don't think you enjoyed it as much as I did. I did. That's the, that's the thing with this whole season is even the ones because I just love the Rick and Morty concepts. Mm. They have they play with such like cool things or make such cool references and stuff that I'm just like I enjoy watching it even if it's not making me laugh. Yeah. You know I wish it was, but like at the same time I'm just like I'm still enjoying even if it's not like making me guffaw. Like I, I'm I'm enjoying seeing Morty like pull this things like scrotum chin thing and then it's like oh he's actually pleasuring him. You know like. <laughs> um. I, I don't know. I had a couple of really good laughs. I really liked the... You're right. Like, I did like... I really liked the... I forgot. I liked the Beth choosing Summer so quickly. <laughs> that, was, that was funny. I loved when uh, Morty was possessed by the, like, worm conquering thing. And, oh, yeah. And then, that was like, pretty good. And then it was coming out of his mouth so slowly. And it was, like, so long. And then they just couldn't handle it anymore. So they're just making jokes. And they start sliding back in. Yeah. And he's, like, still sitting there the whole time going... Oh, this thing's, like, slowly sliding out of his mouth. Yeah, that one was pretty good, too. <laughs> Um, yeah, I just I liked seeing. I, I wish the episode would would just kept kept going. I was just like, oh, these are so fun! Like just to yeah. watch all these fucking things happen. I would have liked that more. So, so you're right, because like the moment they went over and they're just like suddenly having like these fights and their memories are wiped and shit. I was like, ah, uh, like. Uh, but I did like summer coming in and being the contingency plan. Well, my, so my theory during the episode, which turned out not to be true, was like maybe since they just had the evil Morty episode before this, I mm-hmm. thought maybe this was like one of the creations of how e- e- Evil Morty got evil. Like, mm. he found all these memories that were ripped away from him, mm. and he started ingesting them all, <laughs> and he found all the shitty things that Rick has done to him over the years, and yeah. then he, like, he takes the portal gun and leaves or something. Yeah. And, like, that's the one who turns into Evil Morty or something. No, but, but, like, he didn't do that. No, yet. he did see all the memories, and instead he was just like, that's it, I'm gonna fucking kill myself. Yeah. Um, but, uh, I don't know. I, I liked, like, uh, Summer coming in and being, like, the, the, the safety measure. Like, this is, like... Is this little... three? Oh, it's a cup four. Oh, it's a cup four. And she just snaps the thing all calm, and she's still... Well, she had, like, a drink in her hand or something, and she yeah. just tranks both of them and drags them up. 
and then they come back up. And I also even like that scene at the end, like once they were reset back to normal and not like going through any sort of strain or stress, like uh, Morty was all gung ho for an adventure, and there's just like the two kind of fucked up dudes together yeah. taking off, right? And Summer is just sitting there, yelling, yeah, yelling, bitch at Summer and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Summer's just like, God, you guys are fucked up. I'm liking Summer a fuck ton this this season. Yeah, Summer's only gotten better as a character as the series has progressed. So, like even the, the the whole season though as a character, like really like because beforehand like the lost teenager thing was really annoying, mm. and instead now she's just like, I really just want to be a fucked up teenager, and I just like myself that way. She has a little bit of like Rick in her in yeah. the fact that like even going back to might have been premiere, I don't remember, but it was the one where she was like panicking to see Rick. I think it was always premiere, and mm. she was like. Doing the fly, she's maybe if I arrange these dead flies, and he's like, "No, no, that's stupid." And then like, it turns out that is how you did it. Yeah. Like, I like these like little peeks into her. Like, it's like, oh, she's actually like probably smarter than Morty. And also, she's more capable of processing everything. Mm-hmm. Like, she can just she just takes like Rick just knows everything and treats it as whatever. And I think like they've bonded a lot over the season with that, right? Like, she just jumped into the murder world and was fine with it and yeah you know like and he's relying on her to give her like the codes and stuff to like you know uh, do the code fours and yeah stuff. like i like that development with her which is interesting um but yeah it was it was a good episode but you're right i would have preferred if it just remained an entire clip show rather than oh the and the post credit scene actually that, that's the thing that made me laugh the most when they open the door and the alien just sort of flops in dead. <laughs> I don't know why that was. It's like, like the ET yeah, moment. Yeah, it was, like, like, it was so morbid, but like I was just like, fucking laughed. And I knew, I knew it was gonna be dead, but it's yeah. just I don't know the way they animated it. It was like perfect. <laughs> it was all stinking and rotting. Yeah, it was, it was like, like called Bebo or something. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah that one. Yeah, that was. And really they gave it to Jerry because no one would go and see Jerry. Yeah. <laughs> Did you say Bebo? I'm like, yeah. And he's like, it's just in his back of his car. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Rick and Morty again. Uh, Still doing great, but you're right. Like there were stronger moments and weaker moments. I just feel like I'm putting it under such a, a fine magnifying glass lately because I didn't launch into it. But uh, I remember going back over like the original season, the first time I was watching it. There were plenty of episodes I didn't laugh my way through. I'm just focusing so hard on this to get those quotes out of this one, right? The thing is, yeah, I feel like I've rewatched the first two seasons like at least two or three times at this point, yeah. and like they all kind of amalgamated as I'm like. As a whole, that was really good. And whereas, like, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm watching this one episode by episode, and we're talking about it a lot more. Yeah. So, like, maybe if I was watching it week to week, even when it's coming out, I would have been like, eh. and like, you know, I may, might have it more positive if I wasn't just like dwelling on it so much yeah. and actually like. Uh, that's why I'm interested. It. Yeah, I'm interested to go back and rewatch the whole season, but I just still don't feel like there's anything truly like heavily quotable. Everyone quotes Pickle Rick, but you and I didn't care about Pickle Rick. No. Um, but like in the original series, like the original two seasons, we've had like Gish Swifty and Squanch and like so much stuff that came out of Mr. it. Mr. Meeseeks. Mr. Meeseeks. And, like the list just fucking goes on forever. Uh, and even the way that Rick talked, right? Mm. Like it was more in that ad-lib sense from, uh, uh, from Royland. Royland. And you know, like the hundred years Rick and Morty, we're a hundred years we go, we're going to go for more Rick and Morty. A hundred years. Like just like weird. You remember that catchphrase I say? Yeah. What about the Yeah. Like it just felt like so much of the show felt made up on the fly and it felt more natural that this is so scripted it is a different tone it's kind of offsetting but it's not bad it's just different yeah it's yeah exactly yeah it's different yeah it's different because we're loving it i mean we're watching it every single fucking week and like the second it's on i'm like where is it yeah they're watching it yeah, first thing I yeah. as soon as i can every week yeah you know what else is different what wonder woman <laughs> because it was actually a pretty good dc movie it was good for a DC movie. <laughs> okay, so uh, now we're going to be getting into our uh, mini review of Wonder Woman. Mm-hmm. Uh, a couple months late, but we're but we both just watched like the got released on iTunes Blu Ray yeah. now, so we watched it. Um, there will be spoilers from the get go. So again, if you have not seen Wonder Woman, check the timestamps below. Skip ahead if you want to hear us talk about something else or not, whatever. Um, but be warned. Okay, Wonder Woman. <laughs> So, we'll do initial impressions. Um, so, we did not see the movie right away. So, we obviously have the whole effect of everyone raving about it. and Hearing, yeah. it's, it's Hearing about how great it is. And, and then it. running into it expecting, having high expectations. As a matter of fact, exceedingly high expectations. However, it also, as much as you don't take Rotten Tomatoes with too much uh, seriousness these days, uh, it sat at fucking 93% mm. on Rotten Tomatoes, which... No movie survives at 93 for, like, more than a month unless it's extraordinary mm. um, for the longest time. So I was, like, ready to just be, like, blown out of the water about how amazing this film was. Um, 
in a general whole without getting over like the whole fucking storyline and all that stuff. Um, I wasn't extraordinarily impressed. Me neither. You know, like, it's a good superhero movie. It's good. There's nothing bad about it. It's good. There's nothing wrong about it. There, it didn't ever lose me, really, in any major fashion. A little bit with the final fight. I thought it was too long. It was definitely too long. I thought, like, some stuff could have been trimmed out. Because, mm-hmm. like, and they even said, like, there's not, there's no deleted scenes because we kept basically everything. Yeah. So, like, just, it's not a 93. It's just a solid 75-ish. It's, it's it's good. It's solid. It's, it's good. It, it's like, like mid tier Marvel. You know yeah. what I mean? If we're going by that kind of yeah. uh, measuring stick, like it's it kind of like fits in there with a little bit below Ant Man. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right around that level, I'd yeah. say for me. Um, there was you know definitely stuff where I was just like, okay, come on, get on with it. Like we mm-hmm. spent so much time recruiting the uh, fuck what they called the Howling Commandos, mm-hmm. the Howling Commandos, and like. I didn't give a shit about any of them. No. And I get that they're all supposed to represent different sides of war. Like, the one guy had PTSD, mm-hmm. the other guy... Actually, I, I thought it was a poignant moment because it wasn't explained and drawn upon, it, but it was like, he's like, what happened to your people? And he's like, his people happened to my people. And I was like, yeah. oh, that's a good line. Right. But, like, you know, it's all they're all representing different aspects of war. The one guy, he said, you know, he says something about, like, mm-hmm. I have a different skin tone, we're all fighting our own, our own But I almost whatever. wanted that as more of a focus, right? Because, like, in the very beginning, I was totally entranced with everything Themyscira. That was perfect. There was nothing wrong with the Amazons in any fashion. No, the, the, the movie started off super strong. Super fucking strong. I, uh, the beginning was, of the movie is my favorite. Yeah, I was like, I was, I was like, oh my god, this is incredible. This is so amazing, um, and uh, everything was good. And they even even was good when we got into um, uh, like onto the or North America. But then I started getting like weirded out by his little juxtapositions. Like she's trained in um, apparently almost every language and how to fight and all the knowledge of the world and etc but she's like surprised by trains and ice cream and ice cream like I, th- I think that if they're supposed to be sitting you back and training you in everything of the world and if you know the place's language you know their fucking culture yeah um, then you would know that the ice cream is such a thing that exists it's okay if you've never tasted it before and be like oh my god instead of going what's ice cream you just go i've never had ice cream before mm-hmm. i know what it is but i've never had we don't have cows it, it was a cute moment when she's yeah. like you should be very proud of yourself like i did yeah. like that it was cute but it was just like i was like all right some of these things are starting to break themselves but i'm still totally in right and i'm all the way in up until she takes the charge across the, the thing and then when she's doing that i'm like oh my god here we go here's our princess she's amazing Gal Gadot is an extraordinary Wonder Woman still. Yeah, she's sure. great. I, I really enjoyed her. Really enjoyed her. Um, and I'm like, yeah, totally, uh, like, full power, full bore. And I like, you're right, like, that whole moment where she's with the Howling Commandos and she's talking about war and then she's walking around and seeing all the effects of it, so she's getting the reality of what war is. Yep. Um, I was like, yeah, down in, no questions asked. We're, we're ready to roll with this as a theme as her learning the reality of humanity and mankind and the damage that it does. I want this to be the theme all the way to the end. I yeah. only want that. To, I want there to not be a climactic battle at the end. I want it to be some sort of like big moral thing. Well, that's I. Yeah. I agree because I because the entire time it's all about her thinking that like once I stab this dude in the chest, yeah. everyone's going to stop doing having war. Yeah. She thought it was the. She thought in these absolutes like yeah. if I do this, this will stop. Yeah. And she kind of realized that like. They're still fighting. Yeah, it's just and that was the thing. Was at that moment, like there wasn't any huge climactic battle. She, you know, like she fought this guy, but then she stabbed him in the chest. But it was over very quickly. Yeah. She overpowered him as she would. Yeah, and then like wars kept on going, and I wanted her to go do something that would just like end this current threat, but then realize that she had to continue to fight war and go from there and be far more dramatic, yeah. right? Uh, and I was like, we're going there, we're going there, but instead we get into a battle with a CG fucking. Uh, Ares. Ares, from whatever his name is, who I couldn't even believe. Yeah, I forgot his name. In a dumb fight where, you know, like Wonder Woman just infinitely becomes stronger and stronger, and you're just like, all right, now it's just insane. Yeah, the, the last the, the last battle was the... I mean, I feel like a lot of superhero movies fall apart in the very third, in the third act, like mm-hmm. the very final act there. Like, it's just so, like, eh. Yeah. Yeah. Like this suit. Credit to them, they didn't do a giant beam into the sky. No, yeah. You know, There's no big blue beam or anything. It but was a lot of explosions. Yeah, it, the last fight was very underwhelming. I thought the other action sequences were far better, mm-hmm. the, including you know the very beginning with Themyscira and all mm-hmm. the fighting. That was so and fucking good. So good. Um, and even the fight with also uh, uh, her and against the soldiers in the tower and stuff. Like, yeah, yeah. So the soldier in the tower fight. I don't know how many trailers you end up watching, but I felt like I'd seen that entire thing. I'd seen most. It was of that still great, thing. but like still great. But I uh, I felt like I'd seen literally every single one of those scenes because mm-hmm. I was I was kind of like oh finally i see this whole scene expanded upon everything was in the trailer yeah. and that's kind of on me for watching the trailer i, I get it you yeah. know it's hard to let like let that sour your experience yeah. but 
Um, I, I loved how she was, you know, when she was fighting, she used her whip, she used the sword, she yeah. used the shield, she used her gauntlets, she used everything. Yeah. Um, it was, yeah, like, excellently executed in all that part. And you're right, it looks like the last quarter of the act, too. Like, they go off to go sneak into this space. And even that whole scene could have been way better, right? Like, her actually using all of her intelligence and training to mingle in this crowd and hunt down this person, mm. right, and try and get to him. I was expecting, like, this whole, like, here's the spy component where she's not using her powers. Instead, she's going to mm. try and, like, slink through. This is going to be awesome, and she's going to pull it off so well. And instead, she's just like, I'm going to go stab. And I'm like, all right. <laughs> but then, suddenly, off goes fucking uh, Chris Pine, and he's just like, I'm going to go try and bang the mutilated woman. And you're like, why what is the goal what what couldn't you just go over and be like i'm a general where are you working like instead you're like he was hey. trying he's trying to charm her a little bit she has a she has a plastic mouth face oh but it was so badly done and the whole scene I that. no i hated it i was like why are you trying to do this no that that part didn't bother me at all personally it did um but yeah i feel like this movie just kind of like i was really into it and then i kind of slogged a little bit and then i get really into it again and then it kind of like eh, mm. dips a little bit i just felt like I didn't give a shit about the Howling Commandos. I get why getting out they're there thematically, mm -hmm. um, but it was just hard to care about them at all. I loved her across no man's land. Mm -hmm. um, I was really expecting her to say like, "They're like, it's no man's land. No one, no man can get across it." And I thought she was going to say, "I am no man," and like jump on the field yeah. or something. Um, <laughs> but she didn't. Kudos to that. I'm sure there was like a fucking draft in the script where they said that. <laughs> um, that part was really good. I really liked, you know, her taking all the bullets with her shield yeah. uh, as they like slowly get across. Like I really liked that. Mm -hmm. um, there was lots of great moments. It was just like the beginning was. It so just it dipped a lot. It t kept peaking and dipping for me. It drops in general over the whole thing. Like you're right, it does d uh, dip and peak, but the the peak never caught back up to Thamascara. No, you no. Know? Again, yeah. The, the peak is at the very beginning of the movie. Watching yeah. young Diana, and she's, like, doing that little, like, punch kick thing. And, like, yeah. I love that. Like, that was really great. Yeah. And, and I thought, like, seeing her origin was going to be, like, I was going to be, like, okay, this is going to be the fucking slog part of the movie. And it mm -hmm. wasn't. No. It was the opposite. Yeah. And even then, like, uh, her training and her blossoming and stuff, like, you really felt attached. And, you know, you were really excited to see her grow. And everything was really just well focused on her at that moment. And then it just kept dipping up and down but more on a down until eventually it just ended on this down and it it didn't complete the film the film that kind of should have been there by removing the last fight with Ares right or even have him appear and just be like oh that wasn't Ares I'm Ares but like I'm he was all invisible and like in the windows and stuff and yeah. not like ethereal and he was he's like I, I am war you can't kill war yeah you know and I would have been like oh fucking right <laughs> there we go like you know and they, like Dinah just knows that she's got to be like a force against it um, I like Steve Trevor's sacrifice uh, that was good that I like that he died really enjoyed all that uh, mm -hmm. I thought that was a good just like moment for his character just mm -hmm. like his, his character arc of just like slowly coming around to like her way of thinking mm -hmm. and like his you know his whole father's his grandfather's speech about like either do something or you do nothing so he did something in yeah. that moment that even cost him his life I really like thought that was good I liked Chris Pine in that role a lot I, I like Chris Pine I didn't think I would the two, so the two leads like Wonder Woman and uh, Steve Trevor super enjoyed them everyone mm -hmm. else I thought was like very forgettable um, well I mean Hippolyta she had like four lines oh yeah the tennis Karens or whatever yeah, yeah like I mean she had four lines but her trainer was awesome even though they killed her right away which yeah. I was like that's kind of pointless why don't do that just leave her alive like, <laughs> don't do that why did you bother? You hired one of, like, an, a classic actress everyone was excited for. You just killed her off. Mm. Um, and she could easily have come back. I'm hoping they learn from this film. Because, like, st steps in the right direction. You're getting, you're like, you're getting there. You're getting a formula. Just, yeah. just cut out the flair and the, the like, the, the explosions and shit. I, I, it's probably, you know, it's probably some fucking marketing guy being like, we need a big battle at the end. But it would have been so much more poignant if they didn't. Yeah. You know what I mean? It would have made so much There was enough point. action scenes punctuated throughout that I would have been satisfied with and that, that stupid fight at the end. Oh, yeah. And it would have been a really great women empowerment uh, moment to be like, I'm going to just become a symbol for men to not fight, and I'm going to go around and do the thing that doesn't require, require punching. I'm going to be Wonder Woman and save lives and protect people and show them that there's a symbol out there that they can rely on, that they can believe in, and it's going to be a woman and everything. And it's like, awesome, I can totally run with that. And that would have been such an origin story movie to yeah. make this character who's going to basically be immortal and live forever and will be 
our protector. And she takes Superman's throne, like, just in that instant. I feel like this was more of a Superman movie than Superman. It or was. Man of Steel. Like, it had, you know, Steve Trevor and Wonder Woman working together, mm-hmm. like, in the, like how Superman and Lois Lane should. Yeah. Her coming to realize the flaws of humanity yeah. and still loving them for it, even yeah. though they're creating war, they also love and all this mm-hmm. stuff. Like, so, like, it, it was very quintessential Wonder Woman, but at the same time, I was like, this is what Superman should have been. Like, mm-hmm. and they just, like, they did such a better job with it in this movie. They actually got and un- understood the character. Mm-hmm. Uh, they did, yeah. So, like, for all my misgivings, I still, like, it's a, it was it was good, and I enjoyed it, and I think there's a lot of good in this movie. You should watch it. Um, but, again, I did, it's me, it's just the hype behind it. It was just, it didn't live up to all the hype. I, I think a lot of people wanted to, I'm not getting shit for saying this, but because it is the first female-led superhero mm-hmm. movie, I feel like a lot, a lot of people really wanted this to be a home run, and no matter what, they're going to say it was, even if it... Well, I mean, I think that they overlooked its flaws far more easily, considering how critical Rotten Tomatoes can be, Yeah. considering how critical the other guys uh, are on the other uh, superhero movies, where, like, trying to earn a 90 in a superhero movie these days is really hard. Uh, I felt like they tossed it a bone, considering... Mm. As a film, not as what it represents, mm-hmm. it wasn't composed as well as some others have been. No. But that being said, excellent Wonder Woman movie, excellent use of Wonder Woman. Yes. She was amazing. Like, everything was executed perfectly to execute that part. It's just, would have been cooler with a better final message. Yeah, I, yeah, I just think, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there's, I'm, I'm looking forward to Wonder Woman too. I, I feel that Patty Jenkins is coming back. I hope she, like, takes criticism that, mm-hmm. that, that is there to heart and, you know, makes a... The hundred percent run to make the movie, mm-hmm. the second one, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, again, again, like saying it's the best of the DCEU isn't saying much at this point, no. but it's it's still very it's good. Like it's definitely the best. Yeah. Yeah, that's our view of Wonder Woman. Mm-hmm. Okay, I've been playing. Get ready for it. Metroid: Samus Returns. <laughs> um, I bought this because I was having my parents in for a week, and my significant other was having her parents in for a week, and I knew I wasn't just getting a lot of gaming time. I'm yeah. playing Mass Effect and Drama right now. I just knew I was like, all right, okay. Got my little 3DS out, busted it out first time in a year since mm-hmm. Pokemon came out. Mm-hmm. Popped it in Metroid. What a great game! Is it good? Fantastic. They really nailed the like the atmosphere and feeling of Metroid. Mm. Uh, I I have that like that like addictive addictive feeling of like I want to go back. Mm. I want to I want to go back and just like kill another Metroid because mm. like it's all about like killing all the Metroids left on this planet, right? Mm. Um, the only thing I really don't like so far, I'm about like three four hours in. Um, so far, you're killing a lot of Metroids, and they're all the same fight. Mm. They're mini bosses, and they don't take a long time. But it's really a lot of the same. Like, okay, it swoops at you, you jump. You swoops at you, you jump. Do a couple shots at it. Swoops at you, you jump, and you can counter it, and then like whatever, you know. It Is gets that a little the monotonous. Boss fight, or are there other bosses? I have not run into another boss yet. Yeah. Maybe that speaks to I, there are bosses in the game. Maybe that speaks to how not far in I am. But yeah. I'm having such a good time just doing the Metroid or Castlevania exploring thing, mm. and then I find an item, and I'm like, oh right, I can go back over there. Maybe that'll open this door. Mm. And then running all the way back and fucking Classic. yes, and then like yeah. getting there and like, oh, I got a hidden missile tank. I got a hidden. Yeah. It's also rewarding to explore those, yeah. these kind of games. Which is the classic Metroid, even to Metroid Prime, right? It was like when you finally got that thing and you're like, oh, that fucking ledge I've been jumping up for two hours? Yes, yeah, exactly. You know, like, oh, now I can get to it? I totally got it. So that's that's cool. I like that. My And the other thing is I, I kind of don't like how the game like looks. It has that 3DS, 3D art style. You know what mm. I mean? Like It's just that kind of like... I've never been a fan. Slightly higher res than N64, like, looking. Yeah. It's just like, nah, this doesn't look great. I really wish they kind of would have gone with a like a sprite-based game. Yeah. I understand right. that's more work, but no. um, it really would fit the vibe of Metroid more. Yeah, but no, they, I, I know that. But again, they, they nail the atmosphere, they nail the tone, and uh, if you're a Metroid fan, like, this is worth picking up, and then, like, I'm... Fingers crossed people are buying this one in droves because, like, I I'm pretty sure. That's as far as I'm aware. I've seen a lot of people doing it, but I feel like it's one of those things where, like, in my bubble people are playing it, and mm. it might give me the false impression of, like, I also feel everyone's that, bought it, but, like... I also feel that there's probably a resistance of people going back and being like, I want to pull out my 3DS, no, I want to be playing this on my Switch, I'm not going to go and buy a 3DS oh, game. I would have loved if it was on the Switch. Honestly, like, they, it should have been on the Switch, too. Mm-hmm. They should have double-released it or done something. Yeah, I don't understand whether, like, I, I mean, I guess because they don't want to not comply to the promise they made where they're like, we're not going to forget about the 3ds i think that's exactly it they yeah. just were like here this is our not forgetting about 3ds yeah and hey i pull i dusted off my 3ds and i put it in and i'm, I'm enjoying it well, that was the first metroid game in over a decade so yeah like it's been a long time i'm, I'm super i'm super jazzed i know they're making metroid prime 4 or whatever yeah. um but I, I like the 2d metroids more even though i love metroid prime 1 so hmm. uh yeah if you're a metroid fan go pick it up you probably have it's already if, if you're listening to this so yeah hope you're enjoying it I guess to close it off, I uh, I ran to my console and popped in Final Fantasy IX, so that's my current thing. I'm going to be playing that the moment I get home. 
Um, You're making me really, really want to play it. Yeah. Uh, I just, the moment it happened, it was like the, the announcement came up, and then suddenly I was remembering, like, the stupid shit. Like, the opening few hours of that game have driven me nuts since the day I first turned it on, because they're, like, in, in, compared to every other Final Fantasy, you start the game out with, like, some sort of spell, but instead in that one, it's just auto-attack and steal. Yeah. For, like... Six hours, you know. <laughs> and I feel like when you once you get to um the forest, it, it starts opening up a little more with party members. I mean, like VV, yeah, like adds fire, but then at that point you're still just like fucking Jesus, like no one has anything. You're blank for a while, and you're like, I know I'm not going to be actually leveling you up. No, <laughs> yeah. just rush this part. Yeah. Um. So like, it, I don't know, like that first, but I remember that moment so much. I I wanted to go back and just have that. I'm like, why the fuck am I craving that? But I was even craving little things, like just wanting to see Vivi's walk animation again. Yeah. The, the little, like, light side jog. I want to go do the skip rope game, the jump rope game or whatever. Yeah, and I want to go back and, like, explore and find all the shit I never found. And, like, oh. So, I ran and turned it on. It's still everything I hope it could be. It's hard, as normal it is, as usual, to go back to a game like that. Especially with 9, where it was, like, on that cusp of, like, we're trying to look pretty. But everything's still really pixelated and blurry. And jaggy and, yeah. And jaggy. And I'm just like, oh, fuck, if you could have... I don't want to remaster. I'm happy to finally have this game, but if you could have just it smoothed been nice. <laughs> the lines a little. That's it. Just gotten rid of the jagged, janky. Yeah. I would have felt a lot better. It's hard. I feel like it speaks to the game's quality and how much we love that game. That, like, yeah. You can still play it. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I could still play Final Fantasy VII and everything else, yeah. like you did recently as well. But um, I don't know. It's just because of the particular date and time where it fell like right at the end of the PS one yeah it was like very like, like i think the ps2 might have been out at least in japan by then yeah maybe um but it's just it's hard it's, it's still hard the whole time i'm watching this there's so many things where i'm just like fuck if just smooth it a little bit just a little bit it would have made it a little bit more pleasing to play um but i'm really happy to be back into it uh i'm trying God. so hard to remember all the things you're supposed to do to get yourself a little bit ahead mm. like oh get this item now uh, make sure to go back and pick up this thing do um do all of Queena's shit. Go find all the frogs. Yeah, that, that, I remember that one. I know I have to make sure to steal from every boss instantly and early. And yes. also, many times. Many times. Do it all over and over again. You have to let sit, sit there and watch characters die. And like you're not even supposed <laughs> to be like letting this fight last this long. Running out of potions until you get that fucking thing. Because you can get like a blizzard staff from one of them really early. I fucking love the music in 9-2. I'm just thinking about it right now. Sorry. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah dude, fucking. Oh. <laughs> oh, I want to go. I might. I might boot it up when you leave. <laughs> God, yeah. yeah, it's so good. So I'm really happy to be back into that world. I miss the classic days of just worshiping a uh, Square Enix RPG from beginning to end. Yeah, nine is so yeah. goddamn good. If you've never and played got... it, I would. I would implore you to go back if you're into RPGs just yeah. to see what you think of it now. Because for a long time, I felt like it was kind of the underdog. No one really liked it. People loved seven. Yeah. Um, people were like mixed on eight, but nine never seemed to get a lot of love. And then people loved ten. But now I feel like there's been this like. Nine essence, this renaissance yeah. of nine, where I feel like a bunch of people come up and they're like it's my favorite one. Like we're all standing up, like I am Spartacus. <laughs> like I'm like just fucking, or just, like showering praise on it because I see so many more people saying nine was the best one. Well, no, people I'm are like, converting, yes. but people are converting, but they're doing it for dumb reasons. Because like you can't say that ten's your favorite because it's too late in the generations, right? Because it's too pretty now and it's been remastered, so that's too popular yeah. of an option. You can't say seven because everyone says seven, so saying seven now is cheap. Um, and people are trying to hate on 7 because they're like, oh, it wasn't the best. It was one of the fucking best no, people games. People have been hating on 7 for years, yeah. yeah. But, like, it's really, really, really pungent right now. Um, and I'm like, just fucking stop saying it. It was one of the greatest games ever made, period. Get over it. I feel like 6 is probably the most popular number for Final Fantasy. People, like, hold up as, like, the best one. Yeah, because you can hold on to that classic retroness of it, right? Yeah. Um, but now that that's happened, and then 8 will never take its place in any high area no it, it will never come up it was too polarizing it was too it had the draw system yeah. and uh, the weird fucking everything <laughs> everything nothing about it was gonna work i have a face tattoo i'm zell <laughs> but nine is the other one the one that was actually good that was actually interesting you know had all this stuff uh the ending was a little bit meh, cool but... story great characters yeah, yeah. Right. ending meh. yeah um I, I fell in love with the characters in the world. They're just like, yeah, yeah, I just love all of it. Music, fantastic. Yeah, I like everything up, like, story-wise, everything right up until Z Zidane f figures out what he is. I felt that was so anticlimactic. I'm like, he's not special in any way. He's just a body with a soul nah, in nah, it. Nah, it's different. 
it's in case people haven't played it yet. It's nine. You've, you've played it by now. We've got a little little blossoming 14-year-old listening to this, and he's like, I really respect Cal and Mike. No one, no one has ever said those words. But like maybe he's like, oh, they really like nine. I've heard them talk about it. It's on PS4 now. I'm gonna go play it. And then you just drop this bomb that Zidane is Goku. Like, come on, <laughs> come on. Also coming up in two weeks is the uh, Dragon Ball Super uh, one hour long special. Oh fuck! Where Goku attains a new form. So no. I will be talking about it in celebration for at least one hour on the podcast. <laughs> so stay tuned for that. No. <laughs> God. I, I, I'm really looking forward to this because they got all the best. They, they've been having all the best animators have been working on this one hour special. So I'm like, okay, at the very least, this is going to look good. Okay, but to close off our whole thing, we just saw Akira, Tor- Akira-, Akira Toriyama design the first android in forever. And you saw how fancy that was? Yeah. What do you think this is going to be? Well, I already know who's fighting. That's the thing. I already know who's fighting who. No, no, no. But what do you think the transformation is going to be? I already know what the tra- Have I still not showed you the transformation? No. Oh, okay, I'll show you after this. Oh, fuck. Well, it's already that basic. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, i got to go see this. So. Okay, so <laughs> that's it for After Dark. Hope you enjoyed the show. Um, if you want to find me on Twitter, I'm at the G. Mike is at Mike Kent Draws, and Pens and Pixels is PNP underscore Popcast. Follow us at your will. Yep. And you can uh, follow us uh, on all major social media, but give us a like, share, and subscribe on all of those on YouTube, SoundCloud, iTunes. Uh, you know, live us, give us a comment, uh, a upvote, uh, a rating, uh, all that kind of jazz. Uh, we want to hear from you guys, so give us any sort of feedback, questions, whatever you want. Uh, on any of those things we respond instantly every time we like hearing from you guys and we have been hearing from you on a few things so. and if you want to email us it's meet pens and, pi- pens and pixels at gmail.com yep. and that's for if you want to be maybe listener mail segment whatever you want yep. you just want to chat with me that's not very good that's not my email <laughs> you, you tweeted me at the Cal G. Yeah. alright so that's this one <laughs> <laughs> keep that's on that. popping Not an ending. That's an ending. I mean, it's happening.